and indeed the region. So this morning we are invited here to participate in the commissioning of this charging station, but also in highlighting and educating ourselves and hopefully leaving here inspired and motivated toward what is to be the way, the new way of the world and our region must not be left behind. So without any further ado, may I just now invite everyone We have the CARICOM song. Through battles waged and fought, through victory and pain, by test.
Ladies and gentlemen, I will now give you Professor Dale Weber, Principal and Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, who will bring us welcome and remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Master of Ceremonies, the Honorable Audley Shaw, Minister of Transport and Mining, Dr. Gary Jackson, Executive Director of the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, which you will hear the term CRE. now you know what it stands for. Ms. Dion Nugent, Director, Business Development from Jamaica Public Service. Ms. Sherrianne Farkerson, Capacity Development and Gender Expert at CCRI. Mr. Xavier Gordon from Flash Motors and our colleagues from Flash Motors. Mr. Antonio Seeley, Sustainable Energy Engineer, Lithium Consulting. Mr. Andrew Jackson from Jetcom. Members of the CARICOM CCRI team, members of the UWI Mona team. Partners all, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the University of the West Indies Mona campus and welcome to the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Regional Evolution 3 Electric Vehicle Expo here at the Mona campus. Our theme is our transportation future is electric. It's also electrifying. The UWI has been ranked in the, by the Times Higher Education as the number one university in the Caribbean. We've been ranked in the top 1% of universities in Latin America and the Caribbean, and that's of 2,000 universities. We've also been ranked in the top 1.5% of universities in the world of 26,000 universities. Why is that important? We are leaders, and we want to maintain being leaders. Our strategic plan is built on what we call the triple A, access, alignment, agility. And while access to education is clear and students wish to come here, access to research done at the UWI is not so clear and we would like to make it so. We would like to be the first port of call for all industry partners who would like to gain from the research at the UWI. Today we are here with partners, some partners who we've had for a long time, the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology, the Ministry of Transport and Mining, CARICOM and CCRI, and then some new partners who we've met recently but feel like close friends. We are here because we want to strengthen the agenda at the UWI, which fits within our climate change agenda, our renewable energy agenda, our energy efficiency agenda. A world of electric vehicles will take us there. Transportation is one of the largest energy use sectors, and if we can tame this beast, we will do a lot for climate change, for renewable energy and for our world. If we can address climate change and transportation issues, including using electric vehicles, we will be able to reduce the consumption of our fossil fuels by somewhere around 70%. Electric vehicles are therefore a major player in making that decision. So we partner today with CCRI, with the Ministry of Transport and Mining, with our brand new best friends, Flash Motors, with the Inter-American Development Bank, with the Jamaica Public Service, Stewart's Motor, ATL Autobahn, Tropical Batteries, Evergo, many partners you'll see around the room. Today's goal of the evolution, this expo is to promote EV adoption throughout the capacity building of the university and the country. The primary objective is to increase public awareness, public knowledge and understanding of the costs, benefits and the potential role in sustainable energy for the future. The Expo will provide an opportunity for all targeted stakeholders and those who just happen to walk by to see what our EV vehicles are and why the future is electric. The buzz that already surrounds the vehicles that are on display tells me that we've already achieved much of our goal. We want to look today at electric vehicle design. We want to look at charging technologies. We want to look at battery technologies cost and performance trends, and plans and strategies as to how you can get one in your hands. I know I want one in mine. Our hope is that through today's events, our estate management department, and I'm looking at my estate manager, through our estate management department, we will have a fleet of vehicles at the UWI which are electric. 
Now, I know that it'll take a lot, and I'm challenging Flash Motors to help us to get a garbage truck. I need a compactor electric. I'm not sure you have a big enough engine yet, but I know if I give you the challenge, you will rise to it. I also want to make a plea for my chief of security, who tells me that he's really tired of driving around and burning petrol on this huge plantation of the UWI, 654 acres. We need to do it electric. So we stand to benefit big time, and we would like you to benefit as well. EV buses, EV trucks, EV security vehicles, the way of the future, the way of this campus. Finally, we are a research university, which means we want the research that we do to influence your actions individually and collectively. We therefore want to put our faculty of engineering and our faculty of science and technology at your disposal as they research panels, as they research batteries and charging, as they research various components and talk about how to retrofit, how to train for the technology that is coming. We are here to serve, we are here to participate. Please engage, enjoy, and express all you wish. Welcome to the university. Welcome to the Evolution 3. Good morning. Thank you very much, Professor. So you have the three A's and you have the three E's. Engage, enjoy, and express. All right, good. So this is how the university does it. Leaders in their own right and uh, setting agendas, carrying the agenda forward. So, ladies and gentlemen in the audience and ladies and gentlemen online, we are going to be hearing from a series of persons bringing remarks. Thereafter, we're going to be having the main remark coming from our Honorable Minister. We're gonna then close this component of the session or the ceremony and we are going to have the commissioning thereafter, the very exciting component of making sure that we can get into the vehicles and get a good feel of what they are about so that following that, there are gonna be a number of persons getting into their checkbooks and their pockets to ensure that they can be owners. As we heard, the university want to lead in that regard, Mr. Estate Manager, yes. Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, the lead for this morning's event, we are now going to be hearing from the Executive Director of the, Cent the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, Dr. Gary Jackson. Please make him feel welcome. Good morning. As you notice, I have an iPad here. This is about technology, so I'm glad to be a part of the change. Minister, welcome. Um, I'm really happy that you are here. This is a testament to your commitment to the energy transition for Jamaica. Professor Dale Weber, thank you for being here and partnering with the SICRI on this very important venture, looking at the transformation of our energy sector. Ms. Dion Nugent, JPSCO, obviously as a utility, you're going to be very critical to this transition as well. And to our private sector, to Xavier Gordon and his colleagues from Flash Motors, as part of the private sector, the transition is only going to be possible through you and all our other colleagues in the private sector. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Jamaica, as you know it, Kingston, metropolitan area is congested. Agreed? Thank you. The population of Kingston, St. Andrew area is about 39% of Jamaica's population of 2.7 million. The vehicular traffic dominated by internal combustion engine saw a significant increase over the last 20 years due to the increase of car sales in the used car market. The result, congestion, and high pollution. Jamaica utilizes a high percentage of the country's foreign exchange reserve in importing oil for the economy. Approximately 25% of that oil import is coming from road transportation and approximately 30% for electricity generation. To note, the most vulnerable to pollutants in the Kingston and metropolitan area are children and the elderly because they use 
as pedestrians the most. And this was from a study that was conducted in 2007. Several traffic management systems have been instituted in managing congestion. However, the challenges prevail as the urban and suburban areas, current road infrastructure has deteriorated over the years, functioning at full capacity with limited possible road expansion opportunities with limited alternative routes, given what we have done so far. In this regard, electric mobility uh, or electric vehicle as we know it becomes an attractive solution from an efficient emissions reduction perspective. In 2016, there were actually two electric vehicles in the island. Now today, information that we have, research that we have done has said we have approximately 83 registered electric vehicles. So Jamaica has made progress. Renewable energy contribution to electric system now represents 20.19% of installed capacity coming from back then of 12%. Again, Jamaica has made progress. With increased intermittent renewable energy penetration, energy storage solutions is becoming increasingly important and financially viable as electric mobility batteries will form a part of the energy storage solution. So let us talk evolution, the evolution number three. There are three disruptors that are happening right now. One, in the EV market, electrification. Two, automation. And three, connectivity. What is the result of that? The result of that is what we call the seven zeros. Zero emissions. We can have zero pollutions on our roads. Zero energy. We can stop using fossil fuel for our transportation sector based on emissions and climate change and based on the fact that fossil fuel is depleting. Zero congestion. We don't have to be stuck in traffic. Automation. Can you imagine walking up to your front gate and a car just drives up without a driver and picks you up and takes you to your location while you work in that vehicle? Wouldn't that be a sight to see? That is the future, ladies and gentlemen. Zero accident. We can reduce accidents and fatalities by this autonomous driving. Zero empty. Have you ever noticed that a lot of the cars only have one person in it, the driver? And that is why you have so much congestion. What if we were utilizing the vehicles more so when they are on the road? Zero empty. Zero cost. We don't have to endure the cost of owning a vehicle. We could share vehicles through this autonomous driving and through this evolution. And the last zero, Zero worry, no stress. Energy system operations are becoming smarter. That makes the integrating various elements of the systems become even more seamless. The universities, and the, in particular the University of the West Indies, will play a critical role in these technology advancement. Autonomous driving, EV smart charging, and appropriate energy carriers for greater resilience in our energy systems among many research areas. The SECRE, CARICOM Energy Unit, and other development partners develop what we call a regional electric vehicle strategy, otherwise called the REVs, no pun intended, REV, REV, which consider the elements of change, or if, if you might, the theory of change. The aim of the REVs is to deliver intelligent, modern, affordable, clean, efficient, and safe mobility solutions for CARICOM citizens and businesses through the electrification of surface transportation within the community. Within the REVs, we have an application note for Jamaica, which provides insights to policy measure and actions towards electrifying surface transportation sector in Jamaica. So, let us step up and move towards smart e-mobility to achieve zero emissions, zero cost, zero energy, zero congestion, zero accident, zero empty, and least, not, but most important, zero worries. The future is bright, ladies and gentlemen. The future is electric. Thank you. Yes, indeed, Dr. Jackson. As you rightly say, let's step up and uh, zero. Now, a lot of us may 
not know, accept, or be aware that the next, the speaker that will come next representing this particular company is quite attuned, to say the least, to the process that we're here about today. I speak of the Jamaica Public Service, and we're gonna have, we're gonna know here from the Director of Business Development, Ms. Dion Nugent, who is going to remind us, educate us, make us aware that JPS is quite um, adequately and appropriately in the front row with respect to this level of technology. May I now invite Ms. Nugent, please. It is a good day. And I just want to say Master of Ceremonies, thanks for that introduction to my esteemed um, member of the panel here, uh, members of the media, special guests and partners, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I bring greetings on behalf of the President and CEO of the Jamaica Public Service Company. And uh, we want to send a strong message. The future looks bright for electric vehicle growth in this country, and we have been a part of that. And so we thank you for inviting JPS to participate in this exciting electric vehicle expo. And of course, we extend our congratulations to the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in partnership with the University of the West Indies here in hosting this third regional electric vehicle expo Regional Evolution, Evolution 3 under the theme, our transportation future is electric. I'm JPS, I love anything that's electric. So initiatives such as these offer JPS yet another platform to showcase our several initiatives being put in place to ensure Jamaica is ready for the fusion of energy and transportation. So JPS's primary objective is to build a sustainable electric mobility ecosystem, which includes implementing the elements required to ensure the growth and expansion of this emerging electric mobility industry. There has been a shift in the demand for energy in the world. The world is no longer interested in just seeing things just go, the status quo. Everyone cares about what powers the, the things that we have on the ground, their cost effectiveness, and how and if the environment will be negatively impacted. That's what we at JPS understand as well. And within the last two centuries, energy resources have been in constant transition. That's a reality. And we know the history. The first transition took place during the Industrial Revolution when coal was a major energy source. Then again in the early 20th century with the use of petroleum where gas and diesel power uh, powers internal combustion engines in our vehicles and account, which now account for so much of our greenhouse gas emissions. Our world is changing again. But this time we are paying attention to climate change and becoming even more conscious of sustainability. So another transition is upon us, decarbonization. There is a demand for cleaner fuels and JPS and the electricity front understands that and the, dem and the demand is that we must have fewer emissions, especially now as we look to the transportation sector to also play its part in reducing emissions. The answer we now know has been and is and will continue to be electric mobility. Here in the Caribbean we are extremely dependent on the climate and the environment is tied to income generation. You know that our climate brings the money in to our region. Therefore, it should be easy to conceive the viability of electric mobility in Jamaica, especially when we examine the flurry of benefits that it holds. 
And these benefits not, uh, include not only less greenhouse gas emissions, but translates as a convenience for the consumer. And JPS is very interested in making sure that our customers, our clients, our people benefit from this change. And we know on the ground, EVs require less maintenance. They, they translate into our cost savings, our cost reductions, as well as bringing that national impact on our GDP. So we at JPS feel strongly that EV sales, automakers and consumers will need to accelerate their adoption of uh, their adoption if we hope to meaningfully limit climate change. Reducing carbon emissions from vehicles is critical. Currently, road transport accounts for about 13% of global carbon emissions. The government's mandate of 12% of private and 16% of public fleets being electric by 2030, we believe is attainable and should act as a direct stimulus to consumers' willingness toward EV adoption. And we at JPS support this 100%. We're totally on board. We believe it is possible. Electrification will play an important role in the transformation of the mobility industry and presents major opportunities in all vehicle segments. We at JPS have actioned our belief in the electric mobility sector. We have invested in it. We have put our money where our mouth is. From the get-go, we have talked the talk with our initial consultation on policy with the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology as we have been a part of the EV Council and indeed in our consultations with the OUR. Then we have walked the talk as the JPS Foundation's collaboration with the IDB Lab for building a sustainable electric mobility ecosystem for inclusion and access, that particular project known as Project E-Drive. And this has been integral in developing an entire mobility ecosystem of teachers, mechanics, entrepreneurs, dealers, builders, financiers, to name a few, through public education around EVs in Jamaica. Even now, we urge you, university students, lecturers, and all gathered here to dream big in this new world. The eDrive project has taught us that there is just so much possibility in the sector that has yet to be tapped into. The industry is not just becoming, it's electric. Additionally, we have, been, we have even begun to transition our own operational fleet at JPS, our own fleet to electric vehicles. I drove one in a few moments ago, and we have actually uh, installed charging ports in at uh, several of our offices. And so we continue our investment we have designed and implemented our rollout program for our charge and go stations across the island. And for those of you who are tech, you know, the, the plug type CCS2, chatter mode, the type 2s, we're looking to be able to facilitate a range of electric vehicles. And we dream of creating a matrix of electric charging ports from Moran to Nigril Point. So in 2023, we'll be deploying even more charging ports to continue this dream. This way, our EV drivers, and we're always thinking about the man on the ground, will need to be, who will need to be charging at home. We want to be also working to ensure that he's able to have his own charging port at home safely installed for his use and convenience. We're working on standardization in that regard. So as Jamaica's leading energy company, we have and will continue to shape the pathway for this new technology. After all, we recognize the commercial impact and the social and environmental effects of this new sector. There is a great future in the local EV sector, and I want to communicate that strongly. We believe there is a great future in this sector. In fact, it is inevitable as this is where the world is going. The growth and expansion of the industry needs innovation. 
Even as we increase the number of EVs on the island, there is potential for the creation in, right here in Jamaica for us to build EVs on this side of the world. This is an opportunity to create a strategic workforce that can identify the roles and skills that will create the most value for our sector. From where we stand, JPS is committed to keeping pace with the changes in the world and responding accordingly in our business, consumers, and the country's best interests. We're going electric. Thank you. Thank you very much. It seems you have gone electric. You say you're going electric, Ms. Nugent, but it seems you have already gone electric. <laughs> very good, very good, very good. Another round of applause for the Jamaica Public Service, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the context of this morning is going to be presented to, to us right now by Ms. Sherry Ann Farkason, the capacity development and gender expert from the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. May we now welcome Sherry Ann to the microphone. Honorable Minister, uh, Dr. Jackson, the big man in charge of this evolution that we're a part of, Professor Weber, or he was our very willing partner um, in this event, Ms. Dion Nugent, or other colleagues, good morning. All right, so while I wait for my presentation to be loaded, I will ask, it's a question I heard at an uh, event that I was at recently, so I want to do that poll here. Uh, how many persons came here today in an electric vehicle? All right, we have a few. Um, and as Gary had pointed out about, you know, how many persons came here with somebody else in your vehicle. All right, so I see we have, we still have a way to go with making this transition and making sure we're reducing our, our emissions. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about the SICRI. Next slide, please. So the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, I see we're really big on our acronyms. Uh, we have the charge of driving renewable energy, energy efficiency investment in the region. So we have seven strategic programs and with our partners and using the media, we have been able to di distill those seven programs into three strategic anchor programs. Next, please. And those three strategic programs are the Project Preparation Facility, the CARICOM Energy Knowledge Hub, and the Integrated Resource and Resilience Plan. Next, please. And the Project Preparation Facility, we have four major focus areas, um, supporting energy access, which is not so much of a great issue here in Jamaica in terms of electrification, um, but we do have communities that are energy poor, so helping to solve those energy access um, ch challenges, as well as energy efficiency and the integrated utility services where we're supporting our utilities in becoming not just sellers of electricity, but sellers of electricity services. And we know the JPS has bought into that mission. And you see where they're moving from just selling electricity, they're moving into charging and to helping you to find good solutions for, for your home or your business. We also support utility scale renewable energy projects. And if you as an individual or as a company or as a public sector body is interested in a project, we have the project preparation facility designed to support you in designing that project 
and helping you to bring it to bankability. And if necessary, we can help you with pairing you with the right financial partner. And all of this we do with our partners. And you'll hear us talk about partnerships because at Secre we're a small team and so we recognize that whatever we do, as we did with this event, we work with our partners. Next slide. And then we get to the CARICOM Energy Knowledge Hub, which has more than 300 resources to support what we call the, ener the go-to place for energy in the region. So anything you want to know about energy in the Caribbean or how to support you, that is where you will find that data and information. And then we have the integrated resource and resilience plan on the next slide. And that is where we support countries in developing short-term and long-term electricity sector plans to help them to drive investment. And we, those of you who are from the utilities may be familiar with the traditional integrated resource plan. We've incorporated resilience because we don't want to, you to develop just the least cost plan but we recognize that with climate change and with other dynamics that we're moving to a least regret plan, which may not be the cheapest option in the short term, but in the long term, if you're looking at flood risks, if you're looking at how rising temperatures will affect cooling for your plants or how that will affect the availability of water for hydropower, then we're looking at the least regret plan. And a part of that, which is what feeds into what we're doing today, is that we also look at the changes on the demand side. So we're pushing for electric vehicles, which means that you're going to have more people charging, whether at home or at the office. How do you respond to ensure that you have the power available to support persons? You're encouraging them to make this transition. How are you going to be able to support them as a utility? or if it is that you're gonna support them with distributed generation, but there's some, somebody has to provide that service to be able to charge these electric vehicles. And we may one day get to the point where the electric vehicles become a part of the grid and can give you support short term um, by being able to pull power from those batteries if it is that you need to do some short term power correction. And so, the Integrated Resource and Resilience Plan helps you to answer those questions um, as a country. And more recently, particularly to Jamaica, we completed a vulnerability and risk assessment because Jamaica already had a recent Integrated Resource Plan. So we did a vulnerability and risk assessment for the Office of Utilities Regulation to help to answer some of those questions. And so now getting into the meat of the matter on the next slide, we want to look at where are we now? As a region, we have set a goal of 47% renewables by 2027. And if you can see on the right, we're at a, just over 10% as of 2021, which means we have a significant way to go in terms of meeting those targets. Jamaica has set a target of 30% renewables by 2030. And so in order for us to be able to meet that goal, we, are, we have several things that we need to do. If we zoom in on transportation on the next slide, you'll see that we, most of this fossil fuels that we're using actually goes to support transportation. Um, more than 40% for, for most of our CARICOM countries, and it's about 49% for Jamaica. And so, transportation must be a part of this transition away from fossil fuels. And on the next slide, we're sharing what would have been the different electric vehicle categories, the different categories of vehicles. Um, and we see for, for Jamaica, I think, I know we've had a significant jump, um, so I think we're closer to 200 um, EVs now in Jamaica. This data is as of the end of 2021, and we see Barbados leading the charge with electric vehicle adoption, and you'll hear later from um, Antonia Seeley about how Barbados got to where they are and what we could learn from them. And so to support our different con countries in making this transition, on the next slide, gonna talk a little about the regional electric vehicle strategy. 
Now, I think Gary gave you most of the information on this in his presentation, so I don't have much um, to share, but the CCRE, along with CARICOM Energy, and we pulled together an electric vehicle working group, designed the regional electric vehicle strategy, or the REVs, because we want to ensure that whatever we're doing is data-driven. That's the thing, data-driven decision-making. There are several colloquial assumptions that we could make, but we wanted to ensure that we are using the science, we're using the engineers, and we're making the best decisions to guide our different member states. And so on the next slide, we show the, the main aim of the regional electric vehicle strategy is to de deliver intelligent, modern, affordable, clean, efficient and safe mobility solutions for CARICOM through innovation, intelligence, and electrification. So with the different booths that are here today and the different persons you'll hear from, we're looking at finance, market development, business innovation, capacity development and awareness, technology, and infrastructure. And so on the next slide, I just want to encourage you don't be on the last bus. Make sure that you are a part of this. And finally, I will say, we invite you to join the EV Lucian. Thank you. Sherry, and I'm sure you don't have to do much convincing because uh, the fact that all are present here today is an indication, indeed a testimony, to the interest and to the, express, to the expression that, yes, sustainability is the way to go as far as evolution where the vehicles are concerned. Ladies and gentlemen online and ladies and gentlemen in the audience, our partners all, today we do have a very special guest among us, and we would have heard the reason why we're here, and we would have heard from our host through the principal of the university. Now we're going to be hearing from the Honorable Minister with responsibility for transportation and mining. This is the Minister of Mining and Transportation for the Government of Jamaica, who is going to be coming here to set the context and to speak to us about the direction as far as the Government of Jamaica is concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to allow Minister Audley Shaw to feel welcome as he comes to speak with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me recognize Professor uh, Dale Weber. And uh, we have, of course, I have to apologize for my colleague, um, the Honorable Darrell Vaz, who is on an overseas uh, official uh, visit at this time. But I recognize Mr. Brian Richardson, who is from the Ministry of Science and Technology. Um, Dr. Gary Jackson of, uh, how do you pronounce C-C-R-E-E-E? -E -E? <laughs> C, C <-Cree? laughs> Okay. And, uh, our representative from the Jamaica Public Service, Dion Nugent, and uh, Ms. Sherry Ann Farkison uh, from Sikri as well, and Mr. Xavier Gordon from, uh, and from Flash Motors, along with Zachary Hardin uh, from uh, Flash Motors, Mr. Antonio Seely, Sustainable Energy Engineer, Lithium Consulting, Mr. Andrew Jackson of Jetcon, and some members of the CARICOM Secret team, members of the University of the West Indies Mona team, partners all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning everyone. 
It is my pleasure to join in the regional Evolution 3 Electric Vehicle Expo here at the UA Mona campus. And I am honored to be a part of this flagship event being led under the theme, Our Transportation Future is Electric. I commend the different groups and organizations which have joined together to inaugurate this event as we seek to promote EV adoption through capacity building, policy engagement, and supporting infrastructure. This expo is timely as it provides an opportunity to share information and data with different CARICOM member states on the cusp of a new era. It allows us to raise awareness in order to increase public knowledge and understanding on electric vehicle technologies and their cost benefits, including their potential role in the sustainable energy future for the region. In the Jamaican context, the government continues to explore avenues to improve mo movement of goods and people in the most efficient and cost-effective ways. We must effect innovative solutions to bring energy consumption to an affordable level for every citizen. Research shows that electric vehicles are significantly more energy efficient than their internal combustion engine counterparts converting approximately 60% of grid power to energy at the wheels. Contrastingly, traditional gasoline-powered vehicles make use of only some 20% or less of the energy in gasoline for power at the wheels. And uh, you know what some of the other 80% goes towards, including environmental challenges. If regional electricity systems were powered sustainably, electric vehicles could produce significant benefits. Jamaica is in a very early stage of vehicle electrification, having recently adopted initial measures to promote this. Our policies establish a goal of transition to 35% electricity sector renewable energy generation by 2030. Not too long, ago, long from here, only eight years. And the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 10% by 2030. Transition to EV fleet will support achievement if these targets provided that vehicles have no tailpipe GHG emissions, enable more efficient use of the fossil fuels needed to run the electricity grid, offer the opportunity to support new renewable energy generation sources for the electricity grid with demand for side management mechanisms to shift charging to available regeneration. Offer potential vehicle to grid storage stability and offer new revenues for the electricity system. Charging stations are becoming more widely available with the installation of 10 electric vehicle chargers in Jamaica by the Jamaica Public Service Company with a mixture of DC fast chargers and level two chargers. And apparently they are right now spread across Jamaica, Negril, Montego Bay. My only immediate concern is that it's not in Manchester, in my parish. But anyway, I know it's coming soon. <laughs> At least five of the 10 charging stations will be located at gas stations owned by Total Jamaica, or boot gas stations. The AC Marriott Hotel in Kingston has installed electric vehicle chargers 
and offers use of them at no cost to electric vehicle owners. Additionally, some supermarkets such as Lee's Food Fair and Family Pharmacy now have charging stations available on compound so persons can charge their vehicles as they shop. Now, you have heard different figures about how many electric vehicles are in Jamaica. One figure is 83, and one figure is as high as 200. So, um, as a politician, you know which figure I'm going to accept, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I won't tell you that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we, we, whatever is the number, in 2016 is only two we had. Okay? So we, we're going in the right direction, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, research has shown that the transport sector is the leading contributor to GHG emissions in the Caribbean. In Jamaica, the transport sector consumes more fossil fuels than any other sector, approximately 30% of Jamaica's fossil fuel imports. Further, the process of fleet conversion has begun. As Jamaica seeks to capture the benefits of JUTC fleet conversion in this emissions reduction program within the next eight years by 2030. To this end, the Ministry of Transport and Mining has procured 50 buses to enhance the fleet of the JUTC, five of which, which should be arriving by January, February, five of which are electric um, buses. We anticipate that we'll be in receipt of these buses by early next year. Additionally, the Ministry will conduct further studies on EV buses which will be beneficial to all of us. So, ladies and gentlemen, technology is the way forward and Jamaica must not be left behind in, in embracing new and appropriate technology. And so, I'm excited to be a part of this journey as we move Jamaica and other Caribbean countries into the future. We are seeing private partners such as Flash Motors and Evergo Jamaica, Stewart's Automotive Group and, and Common Board to move the vision forward. And I look forward to working with all of you. We applaud all the stakeholders who have worked to make this program possible and look forward to the shared knowledge that will be garnered from this exposition. Most importantly, I hope it will give everyone the assurance and confidence to make the transition to electric mobility. And I'll say to you, it's not in my script, but I'll just say this one to you, that I look forward to, to um, test driving one of the vehicles. Um, my only regret is that I only see red vehicles out there, you know. Uh, not, even, not even one green vehicle. <laughs> but together, <laughs> let us move for a greener tomorrow, right? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the minister is serious about Jamaica going green. <laughs> Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Words well received. Um, very well appreciated. The fact that you took the time to be here is testimony to your own vision and interest and guidance as it regards the mission that we're on. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, we are now going to be moving to the commissioning of the charging station here at the Mona campus. We're going to invite the members of the platform 
along with the team from Flash Motors, to make their way to the charging station, where they are going to do the official commissioning of this station. Thereafter, the Honorable Minister will do us the honors of declaring the Expo officially open. We will have the opportunity for test driving, but I will invite you not to miss the, opportun the further opportunity for engagement right here in the Assembly Hall. You will have the opportunity to be hearing from the Lithium Consulting Barbados, University of the West Indies, Mona, Jetcon, Flash Motors, Sikri. And this bit of information is this session. That session is going to be very interactive. You can see microphone already on the floor. It is an opportunity for you to be able to interact and engage. And so you can leave here well educated and informed so that the right decisions can be made. So without any further ado, Tanisha is going to escort the members of the platform to the charging port and uh, I will invite the Flash Motors team to also make your way to the, to the charging port where we're going to be doing the commissioning. There will be a microphone there, so we should be in earshot of what is happening at that point as well. I'm driving. I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> So the principal will be, no, 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 they're, they're going to drive out and then come. And for the commissioning. So the car is coming around, even though you're not hearing it. <laughs> it exactly. Yes. yes. So Professor Weber, 
is having his drive. So ladies and gentlemen, the car is now positioned and we are uh, ready for the commissioning. So when you note 3.9S at the rear of the vehicle, usually you'd be thinking engine size or something to that effect. Now we're talking about seconds. 3.9 seconds. 3 .9. 0 to 60. So that's what we're talking about in terms of the ability, the agility of this vehicle. So colleagues, that was awesome, okay? I would say, first of all, the very first thing is, makes absolutely no sound. It is quiet. It is smooth. Although we didn't press it, you could sense the power, and I hope we'll get a chance to do that sometime, but it is a smooth, comfortable ride. And the mental component, knowing that you are not polluting, that you are making a contribution to decarbonization as well as improving all our environment. I'm in. I want one. Two? Three? <laughs> and the minister says he wants one. As long as you can get the color right. Right, right Minister? <laughs> minister, what are your thoughts? No, this is, this is amazing. And I, and I think um, we, we just have to, I think, uh, get faster. Right? On this. And part of it, of course, a big part of it in terms of cars, is to encourage your uh, very open participation on it, right? Yes. Well, yes. And we start with engineering, okay? is here today and ready for the Caribbean to be electrified. We just need to make sure we're supplying the, pro the, the market with the right products, like we are today here with the BYD brand, with the ABB charging infrastructure that we're providing here to UAE, and you know, making sure we're also not just selling the product, but providing
So we plug it in and see it work. Thank you, Prof. Um, this is a very, very good point for Jamaica's history in terms of the evolution. Um, as, as the minister mentioned, back in 2016, the first set of EVs came in. I think there were only two. Only one was actually registered as an electric vehicle because Jamaica didn't understand what this technology was all about. Um, but they eventually opened up. I remember entering the, the, the depot, and I'm glad that they are here, uh, when we wanted to pass the car for testing. And the guy sat in the car and didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to start it. He didn't know what to do. So I gave him the keys and put the keys in the door and just said, press the brake and press that button. And when he started, he said, is the car on? I said, yes, it's on. Just shut the door, press that other button, and then press that other pedal. So I didn't tell him anything else. And when he did that, he was like, "Put the car not making any noise? I said, it's an electric vehicle. There are no noise. I said, enjoy the ride and bring back the car safely so you can pass the car and I can go home. So we are very happy to see this transition. We are very happy to see the progress Jamaica has made. We are very happy to see how the private sector has been partnering with the public sector, in particular with these public-private partnerships. Partnerships are so important for the energy transition for any of the countries, and I believe Jamaica is in the right position to transform the entire, um, as, as Zach mentioned, the, the buses. Um, you would note that this will, this will help your congestion. And I was talking to the minister, he wants to know how zero accident works. And I said to him, once you go autonomous driving, you see that happening right now, even with trains. You don't see a train driver in the train. But autonomous driving will help to reduce accidents because it will remove the human element. You heard, at, um, you heard flash motors mention intelligent chargers and the demand control for chargers. You can actually change how you charge your vehicles. So there's so much you can learn from electric vehicle um, um, industry. As a matter of fact, the principal drove the car. What he doesn't know yet, as he drives the car, it's going to change his way of driving. It's actually going to, how he drives his internal combustion engine, he will not drive that car the same way. That car has so much intelligence. It's going to give you the ability, how you brake, you're going to be braking less. So you have less wear on your tires. You'll be, you'll be making maneuvers much better because the car is giving you so much information to inform decisions that you make. And that is how it helps to reduce accidents as well. So we are very happy for this transition to be happening in Jamaica. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. So you tell me that the car is a teacher. So I'm back to school. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. We're forever learning. So, so David, is it you or is it so hard? Who's going to plug us in? So at this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite the minister to declare the expo officially open. Madam Speaker, this great here. It is such a pleasure. It's not my pleasure to officially hear the
All right, so we're now going to be having the actual viewing of the boats and the test driving, courtesy of stewards, courtesy of uh, ATL and uh, ITA, as well as Jetcon Motors.
with two outlets to serve multiple vehicles at the same time, right? Um, it's important to note that most of these chargers um, are not what we call networked or smart chargers. So the charger that Flash Motors has deployed, you know, they would have mentioned um, the intelligence and the communication and the ability to make decisions on charging to make it optimum and efficient based on the grid. So a lot of the chargers we would have deployed in Barbados do not have that capability. Um, the reason for it is that, you know, that was the early stages and we're just going with the current technology, but I would note that that is something that we are considering now and looking at how do we implement smart chargers in some of these applications, right? So that's private. Next slide. Um, so just a little bit more on home charging. So we are at the phase now where we're starting to ask and look at things um, a little bit differently now that we got some more information. So starting to ask questions about, you know, how do you get persons to future proof as they build and do different things? So if you're a homeowner or a new property manager and you're doing a new build, um, when you look at the transportation policy and the clean energy policies across the region, electric vehicles are commonplace in all of those policies. So the question is, why don't we start ensuring that persons put these things in place up front? So while you're building, put all the provisions in place one time so that you can save on costs because retrofitting tends to be more expensive than putting in infrastructure in the first place. But then there's also the, I guess, the less favorable um, side of things where persons start to argue that um, by putting policies like this in place, you are increasing the cost to build and do these kind of things. So it is a good thing to consider, but sometimes it's not always um, easy to implement because, you know, asking someone to put provisions for EV charger and they feel as though an uh, electric vehicle is unattainable for them in the short term is a big ask, but, you know, it's something. So the UK have done it. In the United Kingdom, um, the particular regulation says every new home, including, including those created from a change of use with associated parking, must have an EV charge point. So they have made a very bold and aggressive stance as it relates to building regulations and said, if you're doing a new build, put provisions in place for EV charging one time. So I don't know if that's something you would consider here, but it's um, starting to come up in conversation in Barbados as you look at um, town and country planning and different things like that. Next slide. Um, workplace charging. So similarly to the home charging, um, workplace is another one that I think might actually take off a little faster than the home because businesses actually got a little different way of being able to assess and analyze these things. They, they understand the value of doing things up front and the savings that you would get by, by being future planning and that kind of stuff. So in Barbados, we've been starting to encourage persons, you know, if you want to put provisions in place, there are really three levels that you can do. So the basic would be just put some conduits in the ground where you think that you want to put the chargers. Put that in place up front. Um, you don't want to build a new nice car park, nicely paved, to then go to go dig it up in the future to put in a trench for EV charger. Just put it in one time. So that's like the basic, just do that at least. Figure out where you could potentially deploy chargers in the future and put the conduits in place. So put in that containment up front. So if you want to go another step to intermediate level, you could go ahead and start to build those charging pads where you think the chargers will go. Um, try to keep it as flexible as possible for the different style chargers, but you can go ahead and put those um, charging pads and build them one time. And if you want to go another step, you can consider solar car ports. So if you're doing a new build, look at your car park design and consider integrating the renewable energy aspect one time up front with your um, design of a new facility. So for workplaces, I think this is something um, that you can consider. And the little note at the bottom was a typical um, dual outlet charger is 64 amps at 230 volts. So that's the kind of um, containment and plans you would have to put in place for all the electrical persons in the room. Next slide. 
So e-bus charging infrastructure. So in Barbados, as I mentioned, we have 49 electric buses already in, in operation. And all of them are from the company BYD, um, the Chinese manufacturer. We're familiar with the brand because we see flash motors with the BYD cars. Um, so BYD um, is the leader as it relates to EVs, electric buses and stuff in the, in the world. And that is the supplier that we are working with in Barbados. Um, the chargers are 80 kilowatt um, dual AC chargers. So what it is, is BYD has a, a very proprietary and unique way of achieving level three charging. What they've done is come with a design with two onboard chargers at 40 kilowatts each working in tandem to achieve 80 kilowatts, right? So it's a very unique charger. So you're actually plugging in two plugs at the same time to charge the buses versus um, high speed DC rapid chargers. So there are different philosophies across different e-bus providers on how they want to achieve the high rate of charge required to power a bus. So some persons opt for DC rapid chargers and BYD has gone the route, for the most part, they now have DC rapid charge options, but for the most part, they've gone with a dual AC charger. So what this kind of does, this design actually simplifies the electrical infrastructure a little bit. Um, it's not as cumbersome as the DC rapid chargers. So it's a pretty, or relatively inexpensive charging hardware required versus the DC, but the relationship in terms of um, number of chargers to buses is actually more with this one. So you got more inexpensive chargers um, with the BYD style versus less more expensive chargers with the DC rapid charging style. So it, it comes down to a philosophy and I urge everyone um, looking at fleet electrification to do the appropriate cost benefit analysis and that's kind of the stuff that uh, my company, Lithium Consulting, assists persons with, right? But in Barbados, 35 you, um, charging units, 18 at one depot, 10 at the other, and seven at the third um, location. And those 35 units are currently um, charging 49 buses. As part of the install, there's also an electronic load management system. And this brings a little, another layer of intelligence to the charging infrastructure. So now it allow, allows the transport board to help manage their demand charges. Because if anyone familiar with electricity tariffs will know that um, there's a component of that persons are charged for their highest demand. The, the most power you use from the grid at a particular moment in time, you're charged a particular rate for that. So the electronic load management system allows the transport board to optimize that charging. So if they don't need to surpass 700 kVA at a particular location, they can keep the, the charging load between there. And it also allows them to plug all the buses in um, one time, but then stagger the charging. So it makes it logistically a little bit more easy to manage versus um, dispatching individuals to monitor the charging overnight to then go, go and switch around buses. So there is still some switching around that happens, but for the most part, this is done electronically. So you know that I have 750 kVA of power available to me at the site. If I charge all 20 buses, I will surpass that, so I can only charge 10 at once. You can plug all 20 of the buses in as the buses come in to the um, depot, but only 10 will charge at once, and then as those finish, they would stagger and start charging the other buses. So it makes it a little bit more logistically easier to manage for the transport board. And each site also has backup generators installed, and that's part of the resilience design for the, um, the project. Next slide. Um, right, so it was also important to note that for the buses, those are privately owned chargers, and that's essentially a private network owned by the transport board, right? So now talking about the public EV charging network. So in Barbados, the, the network is owned and operated by a private entity right now company called Mega Power Limited. I work closely with them. And they are also in the business of supplying and selling electric vehicles, maintenance service, all these kind of things. So in the early days, back in 2013, um, their core business was really focusing on 
the supply of electric vehicles powered by renewable energy sources. But in, in trying to achieve the goal of um, supplying all of these cars, it was quickly apparent that you have to have a public charging network to bring the confidence um, to individuals purchasing those vehicles, particularly in the early stages with the first generation Nissan Leafs, which had a much smaller battery and a much smaller driving range. It was critically important to have a charging network. So from 2013 until now, chargers have been deployed. In the early stages, most of them were free to use chargers, but then from 2015, they would have implemented the pay as you use charging infrastructure. So yeah, 40 plus locations. The green ones are regular, what we call level two chargers. And the two orange would be the DC rapid chargers, which are higher speed chargers that you could be able to charge in under hour, again, a quick top up charge. Um, so one thing for Barbados particularly, the charging network itself as an independent business model is what we call a loss leader. So if you look at the cost of infrastructure, the cost of managing the network is not independently profitable as a business right now. And it's basically subsidized by the other businesses, business streams at Megapower. So the sale of vehicles, maintenance, the installation of renewable energy systems, and that kind of stuff. So one of the key things to, to note here, and this is not unique to Barbados, this is actually the case for the majority of charging networks in the world right now, um, is that they're not profitable in the first instance. And that's important to note because um, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation, which comes first. Um, do you put the infrastructure out there and as the vehicles come, they would then use it? Or do you deploy the infrastructure as the vehicle demand increases? So it's kind of like finding the best balance to um, make a business decision on that. But yeah, in Barbados, we've done it. We've rolled out the chargers. Um, in terms of the cost, um, a car in Barbados uh, running, electric car, works out to be about a third of the cost of running a diesel or gasoline vehicle of equivalent size and capacity. It's a little bit more expensive using the network, but if you charge at home, it's about a third of the cost. Next slide. So, um, this goes in a little bit to some of the work that would have been done from 2015 till now. The, the network is owned and operated by Megapower. It was using um, equipment from a company called ChargeMaster. So at the time, back in 2015, ChargeMaster was actually a startup company. So it was a good synergy of a small island looking to deploy charging infrastructure. You got a small company eager to do business all over the world and get involved in the market. Um, providing a full solution, so back office system and the charging hardware. Um, I noted the difference between the startup and where they are now for this next reason. So now ChargeMaster has been acquired by the, the global petroleum company BP, British Petroleum. So they now own ChargeMaster. And along with that, they have refocused their business strategy to focus on Europe and the Americas, Asia, and not necessarily focus on the Caribbean region anymore. This is important, and I think it's something to consider as you take the journey here in, in Jamaica. You have to remember that, you know, in the grand scheme to us, we are big, but to the rest of the world, we are dot. And this was very apparent for us in Barbados because we no longer officially get support with the charge master system in Barbados. They, they have refocused to a different part of the world. So along with that, and I think it probably worked out for the better anyway in terms of advancing and bringing the system to more state-of-the-art infrastructure that you're seeing, because we, we see it here with Evergo, with JPS and um, Flash Motors, more sophisticating, sophisticated systems. So previously we had RFID tags that we would issue to persons. We issue them RFID tags and we will bill you on a monthly basis based on the usage that you use across all of the chargers. And that was a pretty manual process. So it was an Excel spreadsheet that the admin person would go through, look at your kilowatt hours, look at the energy you use, how much time to charge, and bill you, bill you on the network. 
Um, we had numerous um, level two chargers and three rapid charge locations. And that was pretty good. That was a very good system for the needs at the time, 2015 till, till now. But now we are seeing apps, mobile apps. You're able to log on and manage your charging via your phone or web application, more sophisticated stuff. And though the network served us very well to that point, it's now time for a new chapter and getting ahead. So it's, it's a good lessons learned because persons that, you know, a little bit later on in their journey have been able to adopt this technology from the inception. But in Barbados, we were ahead of the game, so we were using the technology at the time. And it worked well, but now we're, we're actually behind you guys. So though we were leaders in charging network and charging infrastructure, in terms of the technology, the technology that's being used in Jamaica is actually better right now, but we're going to fix that very shortly. Next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is just some sample sites that we have in Barbados, and this is kind of the style of how Megapower deals with it. Next slide. So now talking about the new public charging infrastructure. So now we're looking at faster, more reliable digitalization and automated payments. So now we're getting into the realm of what we see here as standard, you know? So we are looking at faster chargers, so we're gonna get high-speed chargers, similar to the JPS Charge and Go um, um, network. We're actually using the same technology partner there. And that would allow us to charge multiple vehicles simultaneously with the DC rapid chargers, and you can get a quick top-up in 30 to 60 minutes. Um, we also fix in some of the aging units, so 2015 till now is that's seven years, so some of the older hardware is actually giving some reliability challenges. So we're now able to upgrade to newer hardware to reduce some of the, the um, downtime of the chargers and make it more reliable to the end user. Digitalization, this is one of the most exciting parts. We now get to implement a web app and a mobile app. And <laughs> Evergo has that, that was standard. But we know doing it, so we fussy, we, we are excited about it. And that will be rolled out. Um, this month, hopefully. And automated payments processing. So this one is definitely um, something that helps us a lot as we manage the larger um, number of persons. So in Barbados, we have about 800 subscribers to the network. It works out to only be around 300 active users, but we have around 800 persons that at any given moment in time can log on or attempt to do a charging transaction on the network. So what the automated payment processing allows us is to take that process from being manual, implement credit cards, and allow persons to be billed near real time, so closer to as soon as they use the charger versus on a monthly frequency. So this is something that we are very excited about um, to see the new generation of the public charging infrastructure in Barbados. Next slide. So yeah, so these are our new partners. So from the hardware side, we're working with a company, DBT, out of France, the same technology provider that JPS is using. We're using a back office provider out of Canada, Charge Lab, and we're using a British company for our um, AC level two chargers, a company called Garo. So basically, we bring all of them together and bring the solution that um, we're gonna have for the, charge, the EV users in Barbados going into next year. Next slide. So key considerations and lessons learned. In going about, um, bringing about a new charging network, some of the things to consider, it might seem um, simple, but the ability to build in your local currency. So I didn't necessarily see this as a challenge going into it, but this is actually one of the biggest things we had to um, investigate when we looked at all of the various potential persons. The, just the ability to build in Barbados dollars was something we had to do a lot of work on. Um, cross compatibility of hardware and software. So um, as I mentioned earlier, when we first started this journey in 2015, we, have, we would have been using a hardware provider which also provided the software back office system for managing the EV network. So it was a package solution. But then, as they refocused their vision and the direction they were going, 
we would have been locked into both the same hardware and software provider, which put us at a significant risk. So one of the key things that we insisted on doing this time as we look at the new generation of charging infrastructure is having the ability to switch between software and hardware providers or work with multiple hardware providers. So, so this, number two, was very important, cross-compatibility and open standards. So OCPP 1.6 and ensuring that the hardware and the software has that compatibility would significantly protect us as a business because um, if one entity runs out of business for whatever reason, we have the ability to switch and ensure um, a seamless transition. Training is important. Um, whenever you're dealing with any new infrastructure, new technology, it's important to ensure that persons are trained and they get the requisite um, knowledge transfer. Um, High-speed DC charging infrastructure is not a stock item. So they're not <laughs> high-speed DC chargers sitting down in a factory waiting for you to buy them. We learned that for sure. So you got to kind of plan ahead and know that um, there will be some lead time in production and different things like that to acquire the hardware that you need. And once deployed, customers get dependent on the infrastructure. So there's no tape boxes. Once you put a charger out there, people will start to use it, and you've got to do the work to make sure it's up and running and reliable. Because even if it's just one person or two persons that rely on that particular charger, um, you have to make sure that it's working. So that is another key thing. So if you don't intend on maintaining the network, don't start deploying it out there because you're gonna get the calls, hey, this charger not working, I need to charge, and you got to be able to respond, so you gotta be strategic. Next. So other cool lessons learned, um, not necessarily tied directly to this, but stuff that we learned in Barbados that might be um, interesting to you guys, next. Um, so one electric bus requires 150 solar panels to offset the energy consumed by one bus. That was very interesting to us. Um, if you're looking at the cost, so the cost of charging the buses, not the energy, is actually twice the cost. So in Barbados, we have a buy all, sell all arrangement in place for renewable energy. So energy produced by solar PV systems um, are credited at a particular rate. And the energy you use within the facility is charged at the regular tariff that you would have for electricity. So what we notice is someone can offset the energy to um, power the buses, but it will only offset 50% of the cost when you translate the differential price between consuming power and supplying renewable energy. So that was an interesting Lesson we learned in Barbados. Next. Um, one bus consumes the equivalent energy in one day that a typical household uses in a month in Barbados. That was also very interesting. And that just goes to show the um, relative use of energy. Next. And this one just speaks to the losses. So between the transformers and the actual charger to power the bus, there's around a 10% energy loss in supplying the power. Um, it's actually not that significant because even with that 10% loss, it's still significantly more efficient than diesel or CNG, which kind of leads me into the next presentation, but we'll just have a little discussion here first. So that's it. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, any questions? So if you need to contact me, that is my email address. Feel free to reach out and let me know if you have any queries or questions about the Barbados experience. Right. Barbados, and I know that we are catching up. And uh, I know that we will get there one day if a surpass what you are doing. But what I want to know, how do you guys deal with the disposal of the EV batteries? Yeah. So that's a, um, a very good question, and it's a very common 
um, question that we get. So in Barbados, um, the company Megapower that I mentioned, they um, through some funding from Caribbean Export, I believe, um, they have developed a battery repurpose lab in Barbados. And what they do is at the end of life for the lithium ion batteries, let me say a old Nissan Leaf from 2013, they will take the battery, reconfigure it in a different configuration and redeploy it for stationary storage application in conjunction with solar PV and also golf carts, but mainly golf carts. So they pretty much restructure the battery and extend the life. So the short answer to your question is right now, we are not um, dealing with re, re, um, disposing of it yet. We are extending the life to kind of kick the can down the road on how we dispose of it. So the plan there is if you have a battery that would have 10 years of use in one application, you might be able to get another 10 to 15 years in another application, and then that would defer um, when you have to actually get to the point of managing the disposal of the battery. And we believe that in the next 10 to 15 years, we would have a better understanding of what we can do and break down those, those minerals and different components to dispose of the battery properly. I just want to add uh, that if you want more information on how that is happening in Jamaica, you can visit the Tropical Battery booth because Tropical is doing um, reconditioning of the lithium-ion batteries. I just wanted to add, um, I'm an enthusiast, so I follow these things. There is a company in the U.S. that has been founded by an ex-director of Tesla Motors called Redwood Materials. They've set up a facility in Nevada near Tesla's factory, and their business is recycling lithium-ion batteries. And their claim is that they can recycle more than 95% of the active materials in the battery, the, the um, lithium, the cobalt, vanadium, all the valuable things in the battery, they can recover more than 95%. And they have set up a business and they're expanding. So that is in the US. Don't know that we'll ever get to the volume to be able to export to them so that they can recycle, but that is the way things are going with recycling lithium ion batteries. So anybody tell you that electric cars have a problem because they can't recycle the batteries, rubbish. Okay, do, do we have any other questions for Antonio? No? All right. Mr. Seeley. Oh, there's one more. Afternoon. Um, the, I saw yes, in Barbados those 150 um, panels um, model, right? What size um, models are those and the types? Oh, right. So I think for that analysis, we would have used a... 400 watt panel for the analysis to estimate that. I think that's what we would have used. But yeah, we know that there are more efficient panels and it varies, but that was just to give you a, a snapshot as to the magnitude of energy used by the electric bus. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Seeley. We okay. express gratitude for the sharing of your knowledge and your expertise in this area. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure it was a meaningful engagement that we just had. And now we're going to move very quickly into the other presentations. We have two other presentations to come. And now we have some project demos. demos. We have some project demos. Lecturers, students, ready? Oh, yes, 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 yes. All right, make her feel welcome as she goes to showcase the projects, the demos, and the research. Thank you, colleagues. Good afternoon, staff, students. So this, in this session, we're going to introduce some of the research projects that are planned or underway at the University of the West Indies. We're going to also speak to some of the partnerships that we have underway with multilateral and development institutions. So this session will take the following format. We're going to have five five-minute five presentations. We call it our fast five presentations. And after which, we'll have a short Q&A that covers all those, those presentations. 
Afterwards, we're going to share two of the projects that we have on the way with UNDP and another with GIZ. And then we'll wrap up the session with Sikri speaking to capacity building initiatives that they have on the way. So to get us off, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start with a review of the state of electric vehicles and storage systems in the Caribbean. Santana Lewis, a Master's of Philosophy student in the Department of Physics, will present. Could you put your hands together as Miss Santana Lewis comes forward? Miss Lewis will present in five minutes, and then I'll invite her to just have a seat, and we'll bring up the other presenters. So you'll have all the panelists to ask your questions. Thank you, colleagues. So, oh, good day, everyone. Oh. <laughs> good day, everyone. So, as stated before, this is just a review of the electric vehicle and the storage system in the Caribbean. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so overview of the presentation is basically an introduction. We'll be looking at the cost trend of electric vehicle as well and get some key points from this presentation. Next point. Okay, so in order for us to achieve a regional and sustainable development goal and mitigation of pollutants and greenhouse gas emission, a significant portion of that is actually from renewable energy. But we have to bear in mind that with this renewable energy, we have standalone systems as well. And this can actually limit the, amount, well, the ability of the national grid itself, right? In providing a peak and baseline port to the Caribbean. All right? So here, we have the Latin America and the Caribbean as well, which have a small portion, a significant portion of the new energy storage capacity project. So we have some different deployments. You will see it in the slide coming um, next. So here we have, this includes the following, an eight megawatt lithium ion system. This was developed by the AES Energy Storage in Dominican Republic. We also have JPS, which commissioned a 24.5 megawatts hybrid energy system, a flywheel system, and a lithium ion battery storage system in Jamaica. So this is in process. Right? We have numerous um, storage systems as well, smaller battery storage system projects in the Caribbean. Next slide, please. OK, so this I've seen. This was before. So this is showing where all the energy deployment comes from. So it's mostly from remote, sorry, remote power system, as you can see in red. Next slide, please. OK, great. So this is the potential of storage system and the EV. So this is showing the Caribbean. We have 15 member state CARICOM. And also, five of those do not have energy storage, as seen in the table here. So most of we have a grid side. So grid side is basically connected to the national grid. So this can regulate the power supply and the power demand. And also, we have standalone systems. So standalone system, this is like microgrids where we have backup system like this generator. So this is when renewable energy cannot supply the surplus of energy. We have the backup system. Next slide, please. OK, so the cost trend of EV storage technology. So we have different type of um, storage technology for electric vehicles, like flywheel. We have flow battery and advanced lead acid system as well. So this is just showing the reduction in cost for the storage system itself. So as you realize, we have lithium ion, um, a general decrease in trend for, from the 2014 to the future, 2024. All right, next slide, please. OK, so takeaway messages from this is that we need renewable energy, and also it can be used to supply baseline power. So remember, we have standalone system. And that now we have the microgrid, but we have to bear in mind that we have also have a national grid as well, right? Which we need surplus of energy in demand. So this is just a general reference where you can find this information for the Caribbean. All right, thank you. Stay on the podium for us. We're, our next presenter would be Dr. Omar Thomas. He's Deputy Dean in the Faculty of Engineering. Dr. Thomas will present on pilot study design for the use of EVs on the Mona campus. Ladies and gentlemen, could, our, could we put our hands together as we welcome Dr. Thomas. 
Thank you, Prof. Um, so, the topic, pilot study design for the use of EVs on the UA Mona campus. I must acknowledge my past students, civil engineering students from the Faculty of Engineering who contributed to this work. Next slide, please. This is an outline of my presentation. You can continue, next slide. So, the aim of the study is to design a pilot study on the UE campus, really to analyze the use of EV vehicles in Jamaica. Next slide. So, we are all aware of the negative impacts of um, carbon emissions and the negative impacts on the environment, and the transportation sector contributes significantly to the carbon emissions. And so, this project um, comes under a global funding, the Global Environment Funding, which you'll hear about later on, with significant stakeholders from the Government of Jamaica and the University of the West Indies. Next slide. The UE Mona campus was chosen as the site for the pilot study because essentially it functions as a small town with the estate management department running like a municipality office, having to manage transportation fleets, fleets for security, fleets for maintenance, and so forth. So here's a breakdown of the fleets of the campus. Next slide. So our methodology, one, is to determine the type of vehicles that we want for the pilot study. Secondly, where can we put locations, um, charging stations on the campus? Next slide. This is a breakdown of the distribution of the different vehicles. The heavier vehicles we classify as commercial vehicles in quotation marks, and the lighter vehicles as private vehicles. And this we will use in our analysis going forward. Next slide. We are looking about maybe five or six charging e-vehicles, and so it is felt that we should have at least five or six charging stations by the estate management department as these vehicles will be mainly charged overnight. Um, other than that, we want to have charging stations across campus. And so there are some criteria that we looked at and so forth. Next slide. So the students did a study. And if you can see the dark purple section, those are the sections that were found feasible that we could put the other charging stations other than those that would be at the estate management department. Next slide. In a pre-analysis, we compared a number of vehicles. I just have one example here. And we can see that the e-vehicle was coming out to be four times as efficient, just for operational costs, just in terms of um, fuel and cost of energy. Next slide. We also did a public survey and here you, see the, sorry, here you see the breakdown of the participants. We did not capture anybody in the survey who owns an e-vehicle, but 4% were hybrid owners, 95% gasoline, and 1% diesel. Next slide. We asked the participants, where would you want charging station to be placed? Um, many of them said gas station because many are still thinking traditionally that's where you go to get gas, that's where you want to charge your station, charge your electric vehicles. Some said business services, 10%, and 4% said public parking areas. But interestingly enough, majority of the persons said that they would consider owning an e-vehicle in the future, and that is very encouraging. Next slide. So just to sum up this five-minute presentation, uh, for the proposed study, it would be good if we could get five or six different type of e-vehicles, starting from motor vehicles up to bus. The truck may be a little bit expensive, but if funding is available, would want to purchase an electric vehicle truck as well. Telematic and GPS tracking data would be placed on both the e-vehicles and the traditional ICE, internal combustion engine vehicles, so that a comparison analysis can be done. Um, of course, six charging stations at least at the estate management department, and other locations that charging stations could be placed, the admin bill, the faculty of engineering, the physics department, and Philip Sherlock we thought would be good areas to put charging station. 
But from this study, we thought that it's very important that we continue to incentivize the use of EV, both from a government point of view and privately, and we need to continue to promote the benefits of EV. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll soon have an opportunity to ask your questions. We move then to our third presentation. It's about solar EV charging potential on the UEMONA campus. Our presenter is Paul Junior Black. He's a BSc major in energy and environmental physics in the Department of Physics. Put your hands together as Mr. Junior Black comes forward. Good morning, everyone. Next slide, please. So my presentation will be on the solar EV charging potential on the UEMONA campus, specifically to the Confucius Institute. Um, through the presentation, we'll be going through the site conditions, um, a shadow analysis of the site. We'll be doing a perspective look, what we're expecting the site to look like, as well as recommendations and other small notes about the site. Next slide, please. So the potential PV site is located to the left of the Confucius Institute. So from the assembly hall where we are, we turn to Confucius Institute. It's to the left of that building. Um, the estimated site would be just about 4,400 square meters. Um, this was measured using the Google Earth tool. And we discovered that using the PV sys software and 410 watt AEG model panels, the system would create about 815, maybe 825 kilowatts of power um, under STC conditions. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, is the video working? Can you replay it? If the video is not working, Murphy's Law, we'll go through um, basically. This would be the site, and as you can be seen, about 6, 12 a.m. now, there's no sunlight. Okay, thank you. So the video will start, and we can see that as the sun rises and goes over, there's no shade over the area of the site we're proposing to use. Um, around 5.15, I don't know if you could spot it, but around 5.15, the sun sets, and around minutes after 7, the sun rises, so that's the amount of time or the time span we're expecting the sun to be shining through. And also that can be seen is around 12 p.m. Um, the sun is coming from directly south and heading north, so this is where we'll orient our panels to capture the most energy. Next slide, please. So this is a perspective look, what we're expecting the site to look like, right? So as you can see in the top left corner, this is where the solar PV site will be. We would have a battery system there because um, I learned last semester that JPS only accepts, they only buy a certain amount of energy, there's a limit. So since we'll be producing 815 kilowatts of power, we can't sell all that back, so it would be better to hold it and keep it in a battery system. A battery system would also make a lot of sense because people are working from the hours of eight to five, so they might come off work after five, and as seen in the shadow analysis, after five there's no sunlight, there's no production, so we'd use this battery system to charge the cars. Um, the, there's a parking lot across the road from, there's a parking lot across the road from the Confucius Institute. This would be retrofitted to host cars. We're not trying to inconvenience the students, so we're not going to take all the lots where we're going to have some lots to, um, that cars can be parked and they can get their charge and then move on through, throughout the day. Next slide, please. So recommendations. As seen in Mr. Seeley's presentation, 
the Nissan Leaf is a very popular EV car. We found that it's not only for Barbados, but for the world, that the Nissan EV is one of the most highest demanded cars in the world as it comes to electric vehicles. Uh, so following Dr. Thomas's example, we'll be using it as a benchmark for the presentation. Um, based on Nissan, that, NissanUSA.com, it is seen that most Nissan Leafs come with about a 40 kilowatt battery, but they can be outfitted with a 60 kilowatt battery. And on the site, it was stated that the 40 kilowatt battery gives you about 149 miles, while the 60 kilowatt battery gives you about 212 miles, right? So with our 815 kilowatt system, we should be able to charge multiple cars current, concurrently, as well as, to put it into perspective, for Jamaica, from Huey to Mobe is about 93 to 100 miles. From Negril, Westmoreland to Portland is about 146 miles. You won't be needing 149 miles. So we're not expecting you to spend hours at the charging system charging your, your car to full potential. But we can say that there are leisure points on the campus. There are fast food restaurants. There's ATMs. You can draw money. There's lounge areas. The World Cup is going on. You can find an area and speak while you're waiting for your car to charge. So the university has opportunities where the electric, an electric charging system can work for consumers and motorists alike. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Black. Our next presenter is Lorenzo Lewin. He's a BSc major in Energy and Environmental Physics in the Department of Physics. Mr. Lewin will present on UE's green transition through solar PV, a case study of the Geography and Geology Department. Ladies and gentlemen, could we welcome Mr. Lewin? Thank you, Prof. Um, good afternoon, everyone. All right. So. My observation and research, as, Dr. as Prof has um, indicated, is the UE going green to a solar system. All right, so the next slide, please. All right, this is an overview of how oh, the presentation will be um, drafted. So the potential of the, the site location is a 273 kilowatt um, PV system. All right, so the next slide, please. All right, in Jamaica, we have the same Pastor Christian, they're Pitney first, right? So why not focus on developing a solar system at our site before looking at any other potential um, areas across the island? So, uh, keep on so here is where we have a nice location by the geography department, which has a lot of space and use um, building sites and use area where we can tap in and generate our own energy. Why would you want to go for water a million miles when you have the area to put a catchment right here and store your own water? So this is what we are potentially doing, creating that site for ourselves to generate that energy. Next slide, please. So the site, that's a particular location. It will be divided into four different segments based on the location of the buildings and the empty area. It will generate, on an annual basis, um, 300 and approximately 90 megawatt hours, right, which is very, very useful. Uh, so based on the location of the site, you're just losing 3% based on shading. So I mean, a give and take, it's a no-brainer. It's a good location for us to implement our own PV system. Next slide. All right, so based on the total capacity of the area, we are looking at approximately 614 PV modules at the size of 440 watts. As, um, as indicated that it takes 150 modules to charge a bus. If we are looking at cars um, generating energy for our own institute, we'll have more than sufficient um, modules there to generate energy that will offset costs and several other things where energy is needed for the campus, right? Based on the systems that were chosen, we were looking at also to reduce costs, but at the same time maintain efficiency across the solar system that would have been implemented at the section. So we deal with um, solar edge um, inverters. We look at the K2 system roof mount and ground mount system, as well as the acid lead batteries to ensure that we have a sturdy system in place that is generating that efficiency while minimizing costs. Next slide, please. 
Now, an overall view of the system, it will result in approximately 258,000 um, US, which is a meager money in Jamaica at 40 million Jamaican dollars. But I mean, if implemented properly, over the time frame, you will get, gain back that profit where you are not spending and purchasing energy from the JPS grid or wherever um, system that you have to use, whether it be generate and gas. And another key factor that it offset is approximately 65 metric tons of CO2. And we know we are big players in the Caribbean of trying to maintain that 1.5 as indicated by the IPCC where um, climate change is a very, very um, important aspect of today's society. So reducing carbon, even if it is by this little amount, is very significant in the role that we play in the Caribbean and in general, the university here. So the funding of the project can be through partnerships of various other entities, such as um, private investors, and one of the big naysayers is um, Sajikor, um, Solar Bus, which are partner with us already to our implementing system by the Faculty of Science and Technology, and as well as the USAID. All right, next slide. And that is where I leave you guys today. Thank you. All right, so Lorenzo is making a pitch for partnerships. I hope you got the pitch. Last presentation before we open up for questions and answers. We're going to have a presentation on determining the perception of residents of two Caribbean islands to the introduction of electric vehicles. It's a project proposal, and it's going to be presented by Dr. Louis Ray Harris, lecturer in the Department of Physics. Ladies and gentlemen, could we put our hands together as Dr. Harris comes to the podium? Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay. Today I'm going to speak on a study that's proposed, and it's about determining perception of residents of Caribbean islands to the introduction of EVs. Okay, first, um, what we're going to be talking about briefly in the five minutes is the rationale for the study, what are the primary aims and objectives, and also we're just going to have a brief discussion on the design of the study. So the recognition, as I mentioned in previous, by previous speakers, is that you know, we have, there's a great need for a reduction in, C in um, emissions of greenhouse gases. And um, unless something is done, something is done urgently, then there will obviously be some significant impact on small island development, small island development states especially. Transportation, as mentioned, is one of the areas that has um, significant role to play in the generation of greenhouse gases. And so we obviously need to have um, take up of EVs. Now a lot of discussion has gone on uh, um, taking place regarding the technical aspects and, we, and that is good, but we also need to understand the perceptions because unless the users of the technologies buy into it, then you know, we're developing something that is not really gonna take off. So what we want to do is to identify the common perceptions that are um, held by persons in Jamaica and another Caribbean island. Um, and we want to also look, see what would impact greatly the take up or what would impact their purchase of the vehicles um, when they come, what are the different factors. And we also want to go into proposing policy decisions. Okay. So, the way this, the, survey, the, the study is designed is to first carry out a, a survey um, of persons, potential owners of vehicles, also going into persons who will use the vehicles from different um, angles, the, 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 those involving the sales, the, the um, repair of vehicles, and all the users of the vehicle to understand um, what are their, what they think about the benefits, how cost effective it is, different applications, um, what's the range, what's the overall appeal of the vehicles on a whole. So they'll be asked um, questions to determine their willingness to invest in different kinds of vehicles. You know, there are different options as we all know, and whether the um, internal combustion engine is something that they would still prefer for certain reasons or if they would want to jump to EVs and then the data that's obtained will, also will be analyzed using statistical tools. It will be carried out in Jamaica and another Caribbean island, as I mentioned, and also um, the example of Barbados, which was presented earlier, is something that will be incorporated. 
and um, because we recognize the, the greater degree of penetration for now relative to Jamaica. So the questions that we asked, general questions, what are the perceptions while they're held by persons? What are barriers, potential barriers to the introduction of EVs in the Caribbean as a whole based on those perceptions? And we want to pinpoint those and be as um, um, detailed as we can and then determine whether there are trends in the usage of EVs that can be used to raise public awareness because as I mentioned, helping to develop policy is something that is important and so we want to be able to link the two and determine how it will be best to um, educate the population what will appeal more to persons. So the hypothesis of the study, um, public attitudes towards the use of EVs, they're positively related to their intention to purchase EVs, that's what we're hypothesizing. Um, a buyer's awareness, knowledge, and familiarity with EVs has a positive influence on their willingness to purchase EVs. Experience with their existing vehicle obviously will make an impact on whether or not they're wanting to make the, the switch because if they're very satisfied, you know, they might have some questions, why bother? So we want to understand and also finally the, the perception of potential buyers of the economic benefits now not just the appeal, but the economic benefits is related, positively related to their intention to buy the EVs. So that, those are the references, and I thank you. Okay. Can we put our hands together for all the presenters? Let's start there, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. The floor is open for questions. We'll have five minutes. Who would like to lead us off? No takers? Please go ahead. Yeah. Afternoon. Yes, yeah, afternoon. good afternoon. I'm trying to. Um, so, my question to the panel is as it relates to um, you guys want to purchase EVs for the school? Like, what type of procurement process will that be? Can anybody come and say, or have you looked into also converting existing vehicles that you have into electric, rather than outlaying this huge expense to buy newer vehicles? Have you looked at that possibility? So Thomas, I think that's you. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. What we're looking at now is to partnership under a grant. So we're hoping that the purchase of the e-vehicles can be procured using a grant. And this is being done in collaboration with the government. So it will follow all the government proce procurement procedures in procurement of those vehicles. Thank you for that. So very soon you hear about two of the projects under which such procurement may take place. I think our colleague had his hand up and we could give you the floor. Dr. Smith, were you saying you want to say something afterwards? I just want to make sure. Go ahead, sir. Hi, good afternoon. I'm, afternoon. I'm Alex with Undergo Auto Repairs. Um, I think my question would, would be relevant at, at irre irrelevant at this point because um, it wouldn't apply to the university. I thought it was okay. something more generalized. Is it a comment or still a question? Uh, it would have been a question. Just throw it out there. If we don't okay. respond, we don't respond. But my question is, there. is there a plan, like something that is more active than just a survey, to get people more interested in becoming a part of the push to change to electric vehicles. Because what I was thinking is, just like the US and Barbados that I found out that they're currently doing a lease program so you could sample, um, for lack of a better word, the EV um, vehicle to to find out if it's something that they would prefer as opposed to a gasoline vehicle so that they can have a feel and understanding what's the day-to-day -day life, all of that. So let's say you have a lease 
and um, the customer has the option to choose between an electric vehicle or a gasoline vehicle. They decide to choose the electric vehicle, uses it for a month, and then they get to make a final decision if they want to keep it or go to an electric vehicle. And it's all on the same lease terms, so they have choices. Okay. okay. It's, it, it's an idea. I hear you. Um, and I'm sure there's a program to, to roll out EVs. What I think we're heading towards is something that could inform the program is if we better understand perception. So it's, these are initiatives running in parallel so they can loop into how persons engage with EVs. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. I, I just want to go back to the point you made regarding the procurement. Um, uh, and what I heard are two, two questions really. One, uh, the procurement process as well as a strategy in repurposed vehicles moving from internal combustion to, and the expert can answer. But certainly for the, the, the procurement aspect, uh, what Dr. Thomas spoke about specifically relates to um, a number of initiatives, uh, partnerships that we are um, endeavoring to do with entities. So. One particular project, which we'll hear about shortly, um, partnered with the government, so you'd have to go with their procurement guidelines. But more importantly as well, is the guidelines of those providing the funding, right? right? So that would be strictly adhered to. Um, I suspect you're also talking about general procurement by the campus in procuring you know, electric vehicles. And we have our own procurement guidelines, which is similar to the government of Jamaica. So I just wanted to put that out there. In addition, um, there was you, yeah, the Confucius uh, project. Um, one question. You made mention of getting the information, um, the building footprint from Google. My question, ever thought of actually getting the actual measurement of the building? He's the estate manager, as you answered. Um, I know I put it on the spot, but I, I do not know if you have an answer for that. The, using Google Earth at the time was the most um, available, easiest available situation to me, but for my next project, I'll be sure to... Excellent. Yeah, you have really answered well. <laughs> <laughs> but we hear the call, estate manager, and the, and the student will be in touch. Dr. Harris has one last comment, and then we'll proceed to... Okay, or sir, could we invite Dr. Harris to give his comment and then we'll take the last comment. Go ahead, Dr. Harris. Yes, um, the comment is just in response to the second question um, regarding the, the survey. And it is recognized that, yes, more will need to be done, but we also want to be very targeted. So we want to guide policy. Uh, before any advertiser puts out their product, they have to know what is it that will appeal to the person that they're, 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 they're targeting. So. In that case like this, persons are not just going to go and, well, unlikely to go and just buy a vehicle based on a drive for a few days because there's so many other factors that are involved. Um, the availability of the charge. I mean, we've heard, we've heard in all the presentations before. So we really want to understand at a very granular level what needs to be considered, a very targeted marketing campaign or educational campaign, I should say. And, that will help the dealers as well, who are the ones who will be bringing in the vehicles. And so we can guide the, the, the government policies, we can um, advise any dealers who are interested in bringing them in, so they know who the market is and what they're all about. That's it. Thank you, Sir Harris. Sir, a, a short comment or wonderful, sir, please. Hi, good Hello, afternoon. sir, good afternoon. Um, this, this is directed at uh, Mr. Black. Um, for, in his yes. presentation, I believe he used the, the Nissan LEAF in his case study for the EV um, situation. And I just wondered if he had examined the degradation of the, the battery. And if he did, what, what sort of impact he believes it would have on the um, actual consumer, potential consumer for an electric vehicle. Um, as stated, well, as, when doing the project, I looked um, intensively on 
NissanUSA.com to see the specifications of the vehicle. So looking on that, I saw that um, the degradation of the batteries, it would last about 25, 30 years. Well, somewhere around 20 years, I think. And as stated um, by other colleagues, battery systems could be refurbished or they could be, um, there's research looking into disposing them properly. So there are ways to attract consumers into getting into electric vehicles, even though after a while we're expecting the batteries to run out of use or efficiency. Uh, I'm so sorry, but three years ago, I had anticipated purchasing a leaf, mm -hmm. so I had to do a little research. And what my research proved is that the batteries degrade um, approximately 10% a year, maybe more. So in less than 10 years, you would have no more battery for a Nissan leaf, right? And similar, the similar statistics for other brands of electric vehicles, and as you probably know, that's the most expensive part of the vehicle. So it's, a, it's definitely a deterrent to potential consumers. And I just thought that maybe your research should have focused a little bit more on that aspect of it. Okay, it is something that he can keep as he goes forward. These are early days in the study. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we will wrap up with that. We'll see if in the next session we can take some more. But allow us, we're gonna, allow me. We're going to wrap up this part of the session and move to the other two presenters. Sir, you now have six minutes. Put your hands together as our, as our participants head back to their seats and let us thank them for their presentations. Dr. Smith, as you come forward, allow me to introduce you. We're going to move now to two projects that are underway. We're going to present them and then you'll get an opportunity to, to weigh in again, ladies and gentlemen. It's an e-mobility pilot project supporting sustainable transportation through the shift to electric mobility. Dr. Devon Smith, Estate Management Department, the University of the West Indies, will present. Ladies and gentlemen, could you put your hands together as Dr. Smith comes? All right. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, I'm just going to switch protocol and hold the mic to my mouse and can move around. The presentation, please. All right, while they're getting the presentation up, so you would have heard on the academic side of exactly what is happening. Um, certainly in terms of, um, and those who would have been here, um, hearing the principal talking about industry partnership, uh, part of the AAA strategy, this is what you are actually seeing. Next slide. So, um, as Madam Moderator pointed out, is a pilot study that is being contemplated. And the pilot study is to enable the demonstration of EV vehicles. So, uh, for example, the comment that you have made um, on the floor um, regarding the duration, that is part of what will be taking place with this pilot study here within um, the jurisdiction of Jamaica, particularly as it relates to um, the, our, our contour, our setting, the, the, the profile of our territory. So the whole idea is we recognize that EV is coming. Earlier you would have heard about um, when we started uh, 2016, I think they said two, um, it, it went up to one, uh, study said 80, another study based on what the minister is saying is over 200, but everything is very fragmented. I really need to really pull all the spots, um, the dots together so that we can ensure we can get going. So the whole idea is to partner with the government of Jamaica, United Nations Development Program and the Global Environment Facility, and that is where the funding is actually coming from. The fund grant, 1.78 million. The time period you are seeing there, four years, and the co-financing, and the co-financing is not necessarily cash. It's a mix of cash and, very importantly, kind. And it's um, scattered right across the public sector, particularly the government and private sector. So many of what you are seeing here um, participating in this um, expo, um, certainly partnering with it. Next. 
Um, so the object to explore and address the prioritized challenges and demonstrate EV uh, technology here in Jamaica. Uh, develop a resilient and low emission public and private tra transportation system. So a lot of the conversation has certainly been around um, domestic and personal use, but certainly looking across the various profile of transportation um, right across the jurisdiction of Jamaica. Click again. Right, so there are five components uh, related to this pilot uh, study. The institutionalization of low carb carbon electric mobility, um, component two, the re removal of the short-term barrier, uh, prepare for upscale and replication of uh, low carbon, long-term environmental sustainability, and that is very important because yes, we recognize that we have EV coming, but in terms of the sustainability, and I think you, you touched on it in part, and the knowledge management, monitoring and evaluation, which is very important when you're dealing with and engaging um, outside partners. So let us deep dive a bit into the various components. So the institutionalization framework is drafting a national policy because today we do not have a framework, a policy in place where e, uh, EV technology. Regional support and investment platform, I hear from our colleagues um, in Barbados, drafting a regulatory um, instrument and technical standards. And I think I heard earlier uh, this morning, um, a, a particular EV owner was in Montego Bay and had to get an adapter because the battery was down and they had to get an adapter. So it's, 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 it's recognizing the necessary framework that we really need to put in place, and that is what this pilot study seeks to um, achieve. Establishment of an information clearing house, part of the, the data, um, the data connect, uh, collection and analysis, and you'd have heard about the, um, the academic side, led by um, Drs. Louis Frey and um, Omar Thomas. Right, next slide. Uh, no, yeah, component three, knowledge base, technical skills, investors, awareness, um, and for accelerating the uptake of e-mobility system, uh, fostering the business spin-off, um, integration of e-mobility concept, implementation of on-campus event. Before I get to item three, I must, I must say that I'm very heartened by uh, JetCon being here. And that is part of the, the whole study, is the sensitization of private sector participating. And I know that Duncan Stroud from Stroud Motors was here as well. So the, the, the energy is there, and what is required now is really to formalize it and get it more into the, the, the business sector so that they can participate. The implementation of on-campus events and workshops targeting um, academia, government, and private sector. Um, I mean, that is self-explanatory. Um, Prof. Um, Stevenson um, looking at, uh, in fact, I remember having a conversation and we decided that, look, we need, we UA need to take a leadership position in terms of having these workshops. Being the leader in, in the information gathering, being the leader and putting the information out there and getting the various partnerships in, in, involved. Professional training for drivers, mechanics, and first responders early market investment by public and private sector uh, stakeholder, which I spoke about um, in part earlier. Next slide, please. I, I think it's slide four. Um, sorry, component four, thank you, right. Oh, with that, with that one already. Um, component five. Good, so this section is really the monitoring and control of the overall um, funding arrangement. So it's the implementation of our project knowledge management and communication strategy, right? Which we're doing a pilot study, so we need to ensure that that body of knowledge is, is collected and collected properly. There needs to be a monitoring and control, as you recognize a pilot study at a specific start and a spe specific end time. So that is what we certainly need to, um, uh, to manage. Next slide. And, and of course, the rollout you can see here um, for the various components in terms of the cost associated with it. The largest being component two, and it goes back to the point of the procurement of the electric vehicles, right? So we are working assiduously to get to that stage of the project. Next slide. Um, that is just a framework of the, um, the, the, the project structure. The UA is right there at the top. 
um, struggling um, with, the, with the government. Next slide. Continue. All right, good. Uh, so you see the council that we have there, um, and Yui is right there sitting at the steering committee. Um, and what we are looking at, the inception workshop, monitoring of risk, um, stakeholders engagement, supervision, oversight, audit. And that is the framework in which we are actually operating. Go back, please. Um, the UA team, and let me acknowledge um, my colleagues who are part of the team, who you would have you would seen there. Prof. Stevenson, um, Madam Moderator for this session, Dr. Omar Thomas, you just heard from Dr. Randy, Randy Kunkun, and of course, Mr. Harty. And those are the members of the implementing agencies in actually implementing or assisting in implementing the project. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Stay with me, please. Okay. We'll field a few questions afterwards. So we move to our final presentation, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going to be talking about supporting the implementation of NDC. These are nationally de determined contributions. Each government has committed and indicated ways in which they're going to be reducing greenhouse gas emissions from different sectors. That's what we mean by NDC. And we want to talk about transforming the transport and energy sectors toward a low carbon and climate resilient future. And presenting on behalf of the team, allow me though to also acknowledge Dr. Donovan Campbell from the Department of Geography and Geology who did a, a, a great deal of the groundwork to get us to this point. Next slide. So these are partners. It's a GIZ project. So GIZ is a German institution that provides funding for energy-related initiatives. So we have CARICOM, we have governments of the region, as well as we have a number of Caribbean institutions partnering on this initiative. Next slide. The, the initiative has a number of different components. Six are shown here. We have the components that will deal with the public sector and will deal with government-related interministerial um, coordination. The next component is the capacity building that the University of the West Indies will lead on. We also have enabling framework, the policy components. This is for CARICOM. So while UNDP, I think, focuses on Jamaica, it can lead in and there are synergies with respect to this program for CARICOM. Then we deal with the, the technology and what are some of the pilot programs that will be coming on stream. There is the climate financing and how the public and private sector can be better engaged. And then component six deals with knowledge management and regional outreach. Next slide, please. So I'm going to speak to what the UE component aims to do, and it's the following. So we want to develop a number of course modules on sustainable and climate resilient transport programs for our existing programs at the University of the West Indies. It's a partnership initiative, so the program will also seek to support vocational training institutions, how we can build the qualifications that they can enable with respect to e-mobility. And that's why our colleagues from JAGAS, we are already starting the conversation there, and we are also identifying partners within Jamaica and the region. We need to do that needs assessment and see how we can allocate different initiatives and budgets to support this. Next slide. We want to engage with greater and enable greater public access to information. You would, hear, you would have heard that Dr. Smith talks about being a kind of point that brings a number of initiatives already underway in the island, bringing them together so we can see some kind of coordination and, and, and connect some of the dots. So we're hoping that we can enable greater public access to information. We want to also strengthen regional platforms and knowledge hubs so that any person can access the data sets and the initiatives with respect to e-mobility across CARICOM. Next slide, please. So we have four activities that we'll seek to implement. Activity one, we're gonna do an assessment of different university courses in relation to e-mobility electric vehicles. And based on that needs assessment, we're gonna identify where we can further develop or introduce curricula or a few courses around sustainable transportation and, and climate resilient transportation. 
because of the different partners across CARICOM, while roads may be important to our context, for Guyana, for example, they have a riverine context, and so that is going to be considered in the program. There's a regional university network within CARICOM that we're going to be engaging with so that as we develop programs, there are programs that other universities can, can take up, they can inform the programs that are developed, and we can make use of institutional knowledge that already exists in CARICOM. The second thing we want to do is, again, we're going to be engaging vocational training institutions, not just for Jamaica, but in CARICOM, towards enabling development and update of curricula. So when we emerge from these projects, we're going to have curricula that is ready to roll out, whether at the University of the West Indies or at some of our vocational training institutions, updating service manuals and tools that will better support e-mobility. Next slide, please. Activity number three deals with supporting the design of regional vocational training approaches. And so here we start including the CXE offices, for example, so that the curriculum development can also inform what's going on at the high schools, whether there is some opportunities available for us in that space. And then the last activity deals with the training of trainers. As our countries in CARICOM seek to implement greater uptake of, of electric vehicle technologies, we're going to need the skills available to support this direction, and it's skills at different levels, so it could be business model development, fleet management, first responders, treatment of batteries, as our colleague already spoke to, and it's an activity that will encourage more participation of women and youth in training. Next slide, please. And so, I think this is my final slide. So, all, the outcomes of this program will be that we have programs or course modules that can be rolled out at more than one universities within the CARICOM region and anticipate modules that are already underway. I know that TVETs are already developing curricula. The aim is to help them further develop and so contribute to that rollout as well. There's a target of 260 stakeholders that we hope that after this three-year program we would have engaged and we will continue continue engaging beyond this program. Next slide. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. We open the floor for your questions. We have five minutes and then I'll hand over to sherri from Sikri to wrap up with Sikri training opportunities. Some persons had questions and we had to just move to the next presentation. You're free to share your questions now if you'd like to still. All right, I've lost those questions. Do we have any, I know there are representatives from Jagas here earlier. I, I, I don't know if you want the floor. I'm giving you the opportunity to take the floor, whether it is to speak to your own initiatives, but I, I, I'm giving you the opportunity to take the floor. Hello, thank you for the lovely presentations. Just two quick questions. Um, where, how do we see and how are we engaging the private sector in the whole transition and, and within these large regional projects? How are we engaging the private sector to be a part of the transition to this low um, emission transport sector? And two, the standards. So we talk about standards and the development of technical standards. Um, how is the cross queue and the various bureaus of standards around the region being engaged in the project and um, also um, formulating technical committees to help to facilitate um, the transition to these um, processes? Just those two questions, thanks. So private sector engagement, would you like to speak to it? Because we already have a demonstration of that and the next session I think we'd also all right, if I, if I, I don't think I got all of your question, but I'm going to try and paraphrase. As I say, private sector engagement, how UA is engaging with the private sector. Oh, with the CARICOM pro project. Okay, all right. Sure, sure. Okay, so... With the, with the pilot project, the, 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 
the strategy is getting the engagement of the government, the public sector, as well as the private sector. And what I can happily report here is that there is a, a very positive engagement with the private sector. If you recall in my presentation, acknowledging um, a number of our partners here, um, we have Jetcon, we have Stroud, we have BMW. And I, I, I recall having a conversation in, you know, streamlining how it is that we should approach a project and engaging one of the private sectors. They were willing to provide information, provide ways in which we should engage because we recognize at a, a global scale that EV technology um, is emerging. We, we recognize that advanced um, countries or developed countries, they are establishing their own framework, right? We recognize certainly within the CARICOM setting that we need to, and Barbados has started. We recognize here in Jamaica that we need to move aggressively. And what I have observed thus far is that the, the energy certainly on the, at the private sector level, right, has been positive. On the government side, I, I will say that the, it is there, but we all know and recognize that government tend to move a little slower, right? So it's just to continue that engagement, right, so that we can get them on, so that we can have those technical uh, framework um, specification that we know would be required for our jurisdiction. So, for example, I mean, in, in the U.S., in, in, in Florida, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the space there is relatively flat, but the profile of our jurisdiction, it's hilly. How does, you know, EV will perform there, those who tend to have a very heavy feed, you know? The duration of the, you know, the battery life, I, I heard on the floor um, earlier about the duration of battery life. So these are things that we really need to do the research, but as well have the engagement with the in, um, industry leaders. I hope that has answered your question. Take the technical part. So something that this project enables us to do is to make use of the capacities that are in different CARICOM institutions already. So you have the SICRI who have already the capacity for training. We have the regional universities network where capacity already exists. We have JAGAS and I'm sure JAGAS has some learning that they can contribute and will contribute, especially you're talking skills levels and the hands-on. And something else that is also enabled under these projects is capacity building in partnership with external partners. So we have our colleagues externally, whether within Central America and the Caribbean or our international partners who have been engaging with us and enabling a number of training sex, um, activities, training sessions. With that collective technical capacity, I think these programs are well placed to move forward and we have three years of learning to do as we implement. I am going to take it as our final intervention and just thank you ladies and gentlemen as I hand over to Sikri. I am going to allow Sikri to make the decision on those questions. We'll take one more. Go ahead, sir. Please forgive me. I was giving you all the floor and you didn't take it. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Tanisha Chambers Taylor, Institution Manager at Jagas. Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to speak a little about training and what has been done to date in relation to e mobility. Okay, then, miss. All right, so Heart Trust and the JPS Foundation would have partnered as it relates to providing training to instructors in electric vehicle training. So to date, we have 15 instructors who would have been trained to carry out training to first responders and technicians. And in January of this year, there's going to be a training that is going to be conducted with um, four first responders and also technicians and this training will be around the island. There are three locations that are going to be taking this training. 
Um, we have Jagas, of course, will be a part of the training, providing the training, and also an institution in Port Maria and another institution in Junction, St. Elizabeth. Um, in terms of other information, it will, you can go on the eDrive um, Instagram page that JPS is um, showing where the training started from in July and what is coming up next. So you can look out there. So training has been taking place and there are going to be additional training. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we'll get right into the presentation. So how Secret supports capacity building is we have a CARICOM Energy Knowledge Hub. Next slide. And the hub has more than, I think now it's more than 300 persons who are registered. And as long as you're registered for, you can find it C-E-K-H at C-C-R-E-E-E.org. We, we love our acronyms. Uh, we have registrations from more than 30 countries with more than 300 resources and the resources are as I said this morning everything energy and included in those resources are courses and I should say our academic registration is the second highest number of persons who register. I see several students who are already using the material there for their projects. I think the last time I taught a course, a couple of the master's students cited articles from the site. And so whatever it is that you need in energy, you can find it there. But on the next slide, specifically for electric vehicles, in 2020, we piloted an electric vehicle training of trainers course. And I'm happy there are some of the lecturers from Jagas who participated in that training. And next slide. So there are four modules. Module one has two segments, um, the fundament fundamentals of EV technology and advanced fundamentals. And then we had a session on servicing and maintenance and then on EV and hybrid EV safety uh, because for first responders this is very important when you have a machine that has such a significant battery size then it's definitely a different approach if there's an accident with an EV and so this segment was specifically for our first responders and the final module on standards testing and regulations was for our policy makers you know, helping to determine what is it that needs to be in place to drive this transition. And so this course is freely available. If there's anyone else who wants to go, you can self-register for the course in the Knowledge Hub. And I just want to wrap up by making a pitch for data. So for all our private sector partners, for all the persons who are working in this space, if we really want to make the best decisions, the university is ready and available to do the research. At SICRI, we don't do a lot of this work ourselves. We're a very small team, so we work closely with the regional universities network. And we're making that call for you to support us, the data from the charging stations, the data from the EV sales, whatever it is that you have available, make it available to the university's network, to the CCRE, so that we can work together to ensure that we do this transition and do it right. Thank you. All right. Okay, so against that background, we are now going to invite, and I heard about the private sector question just now, so we're going to be inviting our private sector partners, Flash Motors, Jetcon, come forward and to join on stage. Um, so this is the moment where, um, and university, you, you as well, right? This is the moment when the, the private sector partnership is going to be on display so that Flash Jetcon will be in engagement with the university as to the collaboration that is critical and very needed in order to ensure that our, achieve, our goals 
are achieved here and after. So to make the discussion easy, I'm actually going to be sharing the microphone. Joshua, you want to bring the other microphone for me? I want to be able to share the microphone with the persons as they sit. Yes, Tanisha, you want to bring the other microphone? So what we're going to have here is this discussion as to the collaboration uh, between the private, can I say public-private? Because I'm looking to you when I said the public the part, public. right? Yes, <laughs> yes, the public-private partnership to ensure that you understand how it works. So I'm going to give you my microphone, and then I am going to, be, I'm going to ask JetCon to start because one would have heard from Xavier just now and we'd have heard from you before but Jetcon you're a new kid on the block for the microphone purposes that is <laughs> so, so I'm gonna ask you to start start your engagement and remember you're engaging the public private partnership discussion all right thank thank you so very much and thank you for inviting me here it's really good to be back inside this assembly hall after nearly 40 40 odd years. I, I, EVs, in my mind, are not going to be very successful in Jamaica until we get the masses, until we get EVs to prices that the majority of Jamaicans can use them. Here's a, here's a part of the reality that we face right now. Over 80% of the cars newly imported into Jamaica sells for under $3 million, or about 20,000 US, over 80%. When I look around, there is not, and, and you know, I, may, I may have missed one or two, but there, ain't no, there are no EVs around that qualify for the government incentives that cost less than $4 million. Correct me if I'm wrong. What this means is that EVs, for now, are not going to get to the masses, to that 80% of Jamaicans who drive, right? The incentive program that is being offered by government right now is simply, in my mind, a non-starter. It works fine for the guy who wants to buy a $20 million car. He, can, he gets an incentive of about $5 million, $4 or $5 million. But for the average driver, the taxi man, the masses of Jamaicans who want to move towards, you know, a more energy efficient transportation. At this, as, it, as it is right now, he just can't afford it. That is just, that is just um, you know, reality. And, you know, you know for, for EV, for the EV project at UE, if EV is not, is not fully accepted in the rest of the society, the rest of the country, it's really not going to work in any, you know, micro community within the society. We need EVs to be available to that 80 percent of Jamaicans who cannot spend more than 20,000 US dollars on a car, right? So, you know, in my mind, we need to appeal to government to revisit those in that incentive program. To, 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 to make, you know, to, to, to make it more attractive for persons to shift towards electric vehicles. That's where I want to start. I know it's a little off topic, but it is something which concerns me very, very, very much. Thank you. I am not too sure how much off topic you are, actually. So, Yui, I think that ball was bowled directly to your, um, to your wicket. <laughs> Ceremonies. I, I just wanted to give our private sector partners. For my first response would be one: Are there any lessons that we can represent for the general populace using the university as our case study? One. Two: We understand the, the market challenges, and so that's why I would suggest that. Two is you would have heard Ms. Farkas speak to data and data availability and something we're thinking about as a university and regional institutions is what data may be available within the private sector that could help with research within 
um, or in relation to EV activities and what research would better support what the private sector hopes to accomplish as we roll out EVs. Those are some of the things that would come to mind for this discussion. Um, so in terms of public-private partnerships, what's most important is engaging all the necessary stakeholders to activate a market. Um, and that's something Flash Motors and our team has been doing in a vari variety of capacities over the past five years. So, you know, we've worked with the utilities. Uh, we've worked with, you know, various ministries, whether it's transport, energy, environment, um, because they all have a part to play to enable um, the, the, the entire ecosystem to move forward because it does represent a paradigm shift in how we think about transportation. It's a marriage between energy and transportation, so it does require all the actors. Um, so it's very important, you know, as we look across regionally, because Flash Motors is a regional company, we're based in Jamaica, we're, you know, employed, you know, we employ mainly Jamaicans, but we are a regional entity. We look at all the markets that sort of have those pieces together. So a great example, and Tony would have talked about it, is Barbados. You know, they're about six years ahead of everybody else. Um, they started working on electric mobility a long time ago, and we're seeing the fruits of that in their public transportation. Um, and the public transportation piece is what I would say is probably the answer to ensuring that more Jamaicans have access to electric mobility and the benefits of electric mobility. Um, as much as private cars are an important part of our ecosystem, public transit is an even more important part. And so for me, particularly in Jamaica, what we're trying to do from the Flash Motors team is advance public transit, whether that's in the form of taxis, minibuses, or full transit sized buses, electrifying those because that's where that's going to be of most benefit. U is a great example because the vast majority of the student population does still rely on public transit. So how can we enable persons who can't afford a car, period, to benefit from that? One way is again providing bus and shuttle services that are fully electrified. Now how does that trickle down? The university's job is to provide educational services to the to the population. But in order to do that, they need to spend a certain amount of money on transportation, on, on fueling their fleet, uh, maintaining their fleet. By electrifying their fleet, they can free up some of that budget and, and focus that back onto the delivery of the educational services. So again, as you electrify your fleets, and that goes for a person, for a company, for a country, or for an institution, by embracing electric mobility allows you to focus more on whatever serv it is, service it is that you're developing. So, Enabling that with an institution like UWE, other ed educational institutions, other corporate entities, government as well, is a great way of us starting it. I think um, that you know, when it comes to the affordability from private vehicles, certainly the technology, um, at least new, is starting at a very high price point. Um, you know, Stewart's Auto Group, which is bringing our BYD Dolphin into the marketplace, that's about six and a half million. That is the most affordable brand new EV that you know, you're getting new here on the island to date, we're hoping to push that price point down as we go forward. And so our partners at JetCon and all the other dealers, we're all pushing to do that because we want to be able to access that market. I do believe it's gonna take a bit of time. Um, you know, the newer vehicles do come with better technology for particularly our tropical environment, uh, which I think will allow for a better longevity of the battery pack and the battery system. So it's going to be a march. Uh, but I believe all the actors that are here on stage and as well as that have been represented here at the field, we're all working together. Um, we are part of the Jamaica Electric Vehicle Association, which is, you know, very, very, very new. And, you know, it's our goal as an industry association to help advance electric mobility together and finding the ways that we can continue to engage the institution partners, the government, um, and the public sector. So this was a great first coming out party for Jeva as well, too, because we got to engage a lot of people, we got to answer a lot of questions, people got to see the type of product that's available in the marketplace, and we hope to continue to work with other public institutions like UWE um, to continue to advance that conversation, whether it's in a promotional capacity or even an educational capacity. Great, so I, I heard just now UWE speaking to data, and if I am not mistaken, that that's the data that should really it be initiated or coming from the private private sector, yes? yes right. Some can be sourced through private sector, whether it is from charging stations, somebody spoke to sales earlier. Data that could help us do research to answer some of the questions that our private sector partners may have. Have you formulated any questions that you think partnerships with the university could help to address? And again, data would have to inform that research.
Yes, because even some of the questions or concerns that we would have heard coming from JetCon, um, the, 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 the kind of response that should really be the reality of that is going to be the extent to which there is empirical data that is driving, empirical data that pitch, pitches the research and then you can drive the response. So the question then is, um, what kind of data do you think is, can you get access to from source between JetCon and Flash? I mean, you know, our charging station here is fully enabled and smart, so, you know, we intend to share all of that data, give full access to UE in order for them to understand charging habits, understand energy transactions, understand user behavior. You know, coming from a more advanced market, you know, I, you know, my previous company is based in Canada. I've been putting in charging stations for about eight years now. I have an innate understanding of, you know, what transaction times are like usually for DC fast chargers. But that's in the Canadian context. I don't know what the Jamaican context is going to be. So capturing that sort of data and understanding, for instance, how long is someone going to spend at a DC fast charger is great for the private sector because it allows us to better plan our infrastructure. So we can understand what speed chargers do we need, how many do we need, where do they need to be placed. So getting that information in an ecosystem like UE is beneficial in the larger ecosystem. So you know, it, it helps us to avoid you know, wasting dollars, deploying infrastructure, and learning those lessons um, out of our own pocket. In the ecosystem that is UE, uh, how many students are actively on campus during the school year? How many students, colleagues? Thousands. 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 Thousands, right? How do they interact with that? And you know, I mentioned things like mini buses and buses, which are extremely important because that data is going to be extremely valuable in understanding how we can roll that out into the larger population. There are a lot of opportunities for electrification. Barbados, again, I, I, I continue to go back to them. They provided a great example. They have lots of data because they're capturing a lot of that data, and we should be able to import that, take that, analyze that, and understand how we can apply that within the Jamaican context. So data is extremely important. I'm a mechan mechanical engineer by training, so that's just you know driven into me. Understanding and collecting and analyzing is going to be extremely important to make sure that the rest of the private sector partners can be strategic in how they're rolling out their products and services. All right, let me ask directly, JetCon, Doc, uh, what support, if any, do you believe UI could provide in this regard, generally, from where you are at? Um, you know, one of the things we would love to see is, is um, how, cons how consumers, consumer behavior towards um, electric cars. You know, you, know, we can, you know, we talk a lot about it and we, you know, we enthusiasts are very excited about it. But in terms of the public acceptance, um, there's an expectation that it will be relatively slow as, as, as occurred in other markets, but we'd really like to see, you know, some study done of the take-up, certainly over the next um, year or so. Okay, there we have one for you, Yui. Um, are you ready to take that on or have you already started? We are ready to take it on. So one of the presentations we did earlier spoke to evaluating perception of EVs for Jamaica as well as one other Caribbean island so that we could do some comparative study. And it would be one of the islands that are early in the implementation, in the uptake journey as we are. Um, so Dr. Harris would have articulated that project. We have had an initial submission to ethics committee because for these surveys we need ethics approval. Once we can make it past the ethics approval, it is a project that we can institute, we're hoping, within 2023. Okay, great. Flash Motors. Would there be any other area of support, partnership, collaboration, you think, between your partners in the private sector, but most importantly, at UWE, that could advance the mission that you're on in the Caribbean? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, understanding their fleet electrification plans and, and helping them understand where the opportunities are because um, it's about putting electric vehicles in a position to succeed. The technology is, is almost there, but there are places where it doesn't necessarily make sense. So I think partnering on both the supply analytics is gonna be extremely important uh, because again, within this ecosystem, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn for future application outside of the campus. So, I mean, we have a great start. We have a charging station there that you know we've installed and now we'll be able to start collecting data. We just need to get some EVs on the campus to actually start using the charging station. It's gonna be pretty lonely this weekend. Um, but after that, you know, we wanted to you know, help them deploy and then start to analyze what that looks like. 
um, and you know, make, just make sure that we're doing things like right sizing. So right sizing is, is how you make sure that you're getting the most efficient vehicle for the usage rather than just taking you know, a, a generic vehicle and using it for everything. Things like that, which are extremely important for private sector and government usage, can be trialed, analyzed, studied, and you know, reported on through UE. So we're looking forward to sort of building on what we started today with them. All right, so let's, let's flip now to UE. It's your turn now to speak to the two private sector partners that you have next to you. What exactly is it that you would like from them, or what, from your perspective, despite what they have requested of you, can you do in order to be able to further their mission? Both sides. Both sides, all right. So I, I will always have to come back to data because something we are yet to get a handle on is what data in the market can we have access to. As we understand what we're able to access and our partners will have to tell us explicitly what we can access, then it can inform what questions we're able to answer. What are we able to pr provide? I think as we hear something I appreciated about JetCon's presentation or, or, or opening remarks was what they are experiencing in terms of market dynamics. And so something I would think about is their strong interest in raising awareness about EVs. I, I anticipate that's something that the university can partner on whether it is by virtue of the courses we offer or the outreach we offer, because we also do a lot of professional development. We also do work in communities. And so there are a number of initiatives that the university can undertake and that the programs are about to put in, in train for 2023. You heard both two of them today from UNDP funded and GIZ. There are a number of initiatives that will be possible. Um, and so if we speak to training, I think that's a market along with Jagas and other partners in the educational space. I see that as an area that we can really put a dent in one of the projects going after 260 trained persons, whether it is from the business side, whether it is fleet management, whether it's first responders. And I think as we can roll out a training program, it's one of the ways that we can build public awareness around EVs and the opportunities with EV. Um, again, I think the university represents a, a microcosm that some of the changes we want to see in society we can start enabling here. And so I think it's a good place for partnerships with, with private sector that the things you would love to see roll out in the larger society, could we test it within the university context? And I think that's where some of our partnerships um, are possible. You know, it's interesting that we would have had this opportunity for the engagement because it makes all the good sense. You know, today I note that you had enthusiastic uh, test drivers on the outside. And I made the comment that even where you may not necessarily see the persons around the wheel today as buyers, immediate buyers, the marketing value of what will happen through social marketing, social media, sorry, um, is going to be significant because that awareness of which you spoke, Doc, about um, making persons at all levels be aware, you can, I, there's no question in my mind about the saturation already on social media based on what would have happened here this morning. So you is already blazing the trail in that regard by hosting this event and ensuring that we would have had the cars on hand. Before I bring Sherian to wrap it all up, um, I am going to ask one other question of the three panelists, let me call it that, um, to be able to speak to us. Remember you're now speaking with the audience here in Jamaica, but you're also speaking to those online in the region. This is regional now. Speak to us about um, what's, what's your message as we talk about this new era um, to say, well, the future is electric. What is your message? Let's start with Jetcon. <laughs> My message is very simple. You know, for many, many years, we in Jamaica have been battling with the cost of energy. You know, the cost of oil, the cost of electricity, etc. In, in, in my mind, you know, the, 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 the combined technologies of solar and, and, and electric vehicle holds the key to our 
to our energy problem. You know, we have an abundance of sunshine in, in Jamaica. Um, you know, we can generate the power, we can use it in the buildings. We now can put it in the cars and use it. In fact, you know, you know techno I haven't heard anybody speak about it, but you know, you know, these cars can also be used to store electricity to power the buildings, right? Uh, you know, a typical electric vehicle have something like a for, between uh, a 40 and a 90 kilowatt hour battery that can power, possibly power a house for two or three days, right? So, you know, when, when the ecosystem is, is built out, you know, solar and, and um, natural gas and charging, you know, we could also have these same cars with, that are parked at nights, you know, uh, energizing the campus, Good. you know, Good. energizing the grid. Um, but, but to me, the, 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 you know, I'm, let me tell you, I, I'm a, I, you know, I grew up in the 70s when that first energy crisis hit, and let me tell you, it was not pretty, right? And we have been living with it ever since. And in my mind, you know, <coughs> between solar and electric vehicle is, is probably better than finding oil, better than discovering oil. We just need to, 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 to use it and to, and to make the best of it. Thank you very much. And that very same point was made earlier by our sustainable energy engineer out of Barbados who spoke about, who juxtaposed the energy um, of the bus and that from the house. So the point is well taken. Now, Xavier, I would like in your um, final pitch and your message to also speak specifically to those young persons across the region that is in the business of um, cars and auto mechanics and all of that kind of thing in this new era where the future is electric, some of which are actually sitting here with us today. Yeah, man, no problem. So just for context, uh, the name Flash Motors is actually named after my son. My son's name is Flash Gordon. He's turning four years old next month and he understands the duality of gasoline and electric. He knows how to plug in an electric car. That's his state of mind. That's his mind frame. He understands that. That's where we're going. We're going quickly to a future where gasoline and diesel may be going the way of the standard car, right? Standard manual transmission where it becomes more of a hobby for people who are really interested in it, but 90% of people just prefer the convenience of an automatic transmission. As the technology improves, as standardization happens, as infrastructure happens, as behaviors change, electric vehicles will become the default of the future and what we're dealing with right now will seem somewhat antiquated. Um, that's what we need to look forward to. As I mentioned before, we're now marrying transportation and energy into, a, into almost the same um, sort of sphere of knowledge where you're looking at an electric vehicle not only as a means of transportation, but also as a possible source of energy for your home, for backup, um, or you know, a place to store your excess solar in the day when you're parked, um, carried home at night, and you use that to run your house. Um, so you know, we're looking at this new field where we're going to be taking a look at technology and our behaviors and starting to adjust that as we go along. Most electric vehicle drivers will tell you that driving an electric vehicle has already adjusted their behavior and how they view energy. Um, and so as more and more young persons study it, get involved with it, experience it, whether it's on a bus or taxi, or when they get their first car, you know, looking at the electric option saying, you know what, I could buy a gas car, it might be a little bit cheaper, but I start looking at my operating costs and the cost of owning that vehicle over the next four or five years, I'm gonna have it and see the benefit of electric mobility that's where you're gonna to start to see the shift. So I'd encourage persons to continue to keep up with the industry. Like I said, we have a for newly formed industry association, the Jamaica Electric Vehicle Association, JEVA, and our goal is to engage the younger population as well with activities like this, but other things. And we want to continue to work through our partners like UWE to make sure we're, we're reaching everyone as well. So the cost benefit analysis is very important. The future is electric, as was said, and we keep saying it. So you need to be able to look at the return on your investment down the road. Okay, so to round it out now, we have to hear from the University of the West Indies. Now you are speaking from the perspective of the region. So it's the regional perspective we want to be able to get to round out this segment. Over to you. Thank you so much. 
Um, first, allow me to quickly thank our industry partners and others who would be who have, would have participated in the expo. Something we would ask as universities across the region is increasingly how can we help private sector partners to answer questions important to their industry. Um, we would love that our private sector partners, as demonstrated today, but if we could expand as well, what are those things? Market dynamics came up. We are ready to say, all right, how can we help you address market dynamics and that the size of our markets are a constraint? So we have to ro roll out a public awareness program. The beauty of our university, the policy we can address, the business component we can address, the science behind EVs we can address, the training we can address. There are number of opportunities that our regional institutions offer, our universities, JAGAS, TVETs across the region offer. And my plea is that private sector partners, as demonstrated today, will engage us even in a greater way. Let us help to answer the questions you have and that can expand your own objectives that can allow you to fulfill your own strategic goals. Great. Thank you very much. A round of applause for the partnership that we see here on display. It's collaboration in action for the reality of sustainability that we're speaking of. So to round it all out today, we're going to call Sharian from Sikri, who is going to uh, wrap things up. This is, we're going to be calling it a wrap on today, yes? How was it for you? That's okay? Yes. All right. It was better than we could have imagined. Uh, things went seamlessly. And I'll start my vote of thanks by saying I told somebody this morning we chose the right event managers. <laughs> so, it's our pleasure. It's so our kudos pleasure. Kudos to Sparkles for executing the vision and for all our other partners who came on board. Uh, we definitely achieved our goal. We got the word out there in a very big way this morning. I know the test drives were, were good and everything, the presentations, the information that was shared, I think we definitely mission accomplished. Lovely, lovely. Now that's always very important at the end of any, any event when the key organizer can speak to mission accomplished. The accomplishment must, at the end of the day, it is really what would be achieved. It's all well and good that we say we're tired, but were we productive? And it was indeed a productive one. It was indeed a productive one. And I want to say as well, and I'll, I'll go to my partners as, as we talk, uh, when we sent the request to the university, it was a request for them to host the event. But they came on board as our primary partner from the leadership of the principal who was in all the planning meetings, okay. all the way down to all of the, the Faculty of Science and Technology, the Faculty of Engineering, the Estate Management Department. They fully came on board, supported us, the security team. I saw them, they got quite a bit of work stopping traffic to allow the cars to go ahead. It was definitely a strong partnership with the university and we definitely will continue this partnership. Well, we have a formal arrangement, we have a memorandum of understanding with the university, and this was just one of those very well-led partnerships that we were able to do. No, that is very, very, that's very, very important because we're talking about public-private partnership as we sit here, but you're talking about partnership, and as we said at the beginning, where the university, based on its pivotal role in the region, can lead the agenda, can carry the agenda, can look at ways and means of pitching the agenda even further as we talk about uh, sustainability. Definitely, and I'm looking forward to even more from, from the UE and from our other public sector colleagues who have been a part of this. The Ministry of Transport, the minister was very excited <laughs> to be here um, and definitely his entire team, I think most of them were here at some point during the day, the Island Traffic Authority, they had Absolutely. a booth that was there and it's definitely, I think the buzz has been felt and it will just keep spreading across the certainly was very encouraging when I saw that the Island Traffic Authority actually came here in an EV. They, so, so that you, you saw leadership by example all around, and so you see the buy-in at all levels. 
Yes, definitely. And I think they were also showcasing the first electric bus for JUTC. Yes. We were hoping to have it here today, but we didn't have it. But you will soon see that on the road. Um, coming again out of data-driven information. So there was a study that was funded by the IDB. Antonio was one of the consultants on that, um, where they were looking at should they go natural gas versus electric vehicle, you know, and comparing that to the diesel that we're currently using. And we're happy to see out of that data-driven decision, the EVs are going to soon be on the road. And when you're thinking about um, curbing noise pollution, EV is the way to go because, you know, you have <laughs> no challenge in that regard. I wonder if the Yang Yang bikes are going to be a part of it. Boy, so. <laughs> I tell you, is there anybody who is looking at carrying in electric bikes? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Tropical. All right. Tropical. Okay. okay. Tropical. Tropical. All right. I would definitely, boy, I would probably even invest in that. I, yeah, the Yang Yang bikes oh, are. Yes, 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 yes. But it was a good day. It was a good day. So it's at this point that we really want to show gratitude to every single person for your participation, for your presence, for your engagement, for staying with us throughout the process, for listening, for interacting and for the engagement. It is very, very good, and it is well done when I can listen to um, the mind behind all of this, saying it was a day well, a mission well accomplished. Yes, so I just wanna wrap up by making sure I don't miss anybody. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> all right, so I will start with the, the Secree team. So there were two of us here today, Dr. Jackson, our executive director, and myself, but it was definitely a team effort um, from the Secree, the brainchild of this, because you see it's Evolution 3, the brainchild was with CARICOM Energy, and Dr. Gardner, who is now with the Secree team, was really, played a pivotal role in that, and we had other team members who were crucial to getting the procurement, so anybody who did procurement would have interacted with Felicia. Um, she's not here today, but definitely the Secree team has done a lot to make sure that today would have happened. Um, I already mentioned Sparkles, who have done very well, and UETV, who is doing the live streaming. And if there's anything you missed today, for the next six months, you'll be able to catch it on UETV to see what would have happened today. And then to the different booth holders, so Island Traffic Authority, Evergo, Jamaica, JetCon, Uimona, Tropical Mobility and Tropical Renewable Energy, the Jamaica Electric Vehicle Association, and even if you do not yet have your EV, you can join the association so you can start being a part of that conversation. JPS, with the JPS Charge and Go, and with the eDrive initiative, and they were also one of our sponsors. News Talk, who made sure the word got out live, Stewart's Automotive, Flash Motors, ATL Autobahn, who, along with JetCon, ensured that you were able to get the feel. So I hope you've now been fully inspired, you've fully bought into the vision. And we thank you all for joining the EV Lucian, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. It was a good day. Thank you.